डॉक्टर याशिका कैन यू हियर मी आई कैन हियर यू डॉक्टर याशिका माय टाइम स्लॉट इज ऑफ 60 मिनट्स और 90 मिनट्स सर 90 मिनट्स ओके या ओके थैंक यू ओके सर learning new things is certainly exciting and scary at the same time but should always be encouraged because whether it is it was a good experience or a bad experience a life lesson li lasts forever so here i welcome you all to the day 8 of homeopathic learning series by team homeopathy 360 with our collaborators so i welcome each one of you to the platform and uh, i hope everybody is again excited and with us today to listen to us listen and learn from our speakers the best uh, lecturers of the fraternity uh, fraternity from all over the country so i hope uh, uh, we we are trying our level best to make you competent in the hanumanian homeopathy through this series and we are uh, we are able to at least fulfill best of our uh, part so uh let's just uh, take the name of our master master samuel hanuman sir and in the name of our master let's begin the day 8 of this series a very warm afternoon to each one of you who have joined us today i dr yashika aroda pri feel privileged enough to welcome you all to this session and uh, i am blessed enough to uh, be the moderator of today's session because we again have two great speakers from the from uh, from uh, uh, the country so uh, i hope everybody is excited along with me to listen from them and to learn from them to get homeopathic training from them uh, because we will be covering materia medica as well as organon today so we are i hope everybody is excited to gain the homeopathic training so uh, and uh, pr uh, get the solid foundation how you can apply such uh, 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 how, how you can apply homeopathic principles in your practice as well as um, Well, are ready to learn the uh, homeopathic fundamental principles as well as remedies with illustrations. We have two great speakers who have uh, joined us today. But before we begin, I just want to thank uh, two of uh, many uh, my team as well as the person behind this idea of homeopathic learning series. I would like to thank Mr. Manish Jain, the, one of the directors of uh, Vision Publishers. Uh, who is behind this idea of homeopathic learning series to incite uh, that training to incite solid foundation to provide people a wealth of information that is necessary to know the core essence of homeopathy through this series also i would like to welcome my team as well as thank my team who is with us um, uh, of, of for all long to promote this series as well as uh, try to uh, keep you updated i welcome dr rajesh sir with us who will be the at the who will be at the back end system to ensure that the webinar runs smooth so i welcome dr rajesh and uh, my whole team i would like to thank my whole team who is involved in this series as well as promotion as well as uh, the website work which is being uh, the, uh, which is, uh, the website of www.homeopathy360.com which is one of the most updated portal for online publication of all kinds of course material research publications latest news career opportunities and research papers and each and every information about homeopathy uh, and job vacancies whatever uh, information is to be updated we try to uh, connect all homeopaths plus provide them each and every single information related to homeopathy through our website that is www.homeopathy360.com you are requested to please uh, uh, visit the website as well as we invite you all to uh, contribute your expertise your uh, your experiences with us uh, uh, so for that you can submit your articles your research papers or whatever at yashika@homeopathy360.com if you have any webinar related queries you can mail us at webinar@homeopathy360.com before we begin let me just uh, tell you the unique that uniqueness of this webinar lies in reaching one of the one of our learners each one of our learners personally and for that we have a chat box on our screens 
wherein you can type your questions and send to us by pressing the <coughs> button next to the box. We'll be running a question answer session at the e end of each session. Like we have a question answer session at 420, 425, where you can clarify the queries from the first speaker, as well as we have a question answer session at the end of the webinar that is 545, wherein you can clarify the questions from the another speaker. So I hope everybody is excited to learn from them. Uh, and without wasting any more time, I just want to introduce to you uh, the dignified speakers of today. A teacher's job isn't to fill is, isn't to fill their heads with knowledge, but to spark an interest and desire to learn about a subject. So yes, uh, we have a great speaker who actually incites uh, uh, incites a spark in in his students uh, and uh, invokes their invoke a desire to learn about uh, uh, about this subject. We have a speaker with us, Dr. Tarkeshwar Jain sir from Jaipur. He is the registrar of Homeopathy University since uh, 2010 and has a teaching experience of 19 years. He's the professor and head in the Department of Materia Medica at Homeopathy University, Jaipur, and also a guest faculty at more than 20 institutes of USA, Europe, UK, South Africa, and South Asia. He has been teaching through webinars uh, on World Homeopathic Network, JHC, and he has, he has been speaker in uh, international as well as national seminars. He's also the editor of Journal of Homeopathy University, that is a peer-reviewed scientific journal. He's also a PhD coordinator since 2013 in Homeopathy University at Jaipur. Also, he's the PhD supervisor since 2013. He has uh, more than 20 articles which are being published in peer-reviewed as well as other scientific journals. And uh, he has a clinical experience of 26 years. He has got regular columns in leading newspapers of Rajasthan. He has been the developer of Kenbo software. That is a classical homeopathic software. And also he's a very skilled orator, orator teaching materia medica and homeopathic philosophy and many homeopathic subjects worldwide in his interactive style. So we have we are lucky to have him here today. And I welcome on behalf of the whole team of Homeopathy 360 as well as our collaborators. Uh, uh, welcome, sir, to, for the uh, for the session. He'll be Thank discussing you. on the topic. He'll be, he'll be become rediscovered in view of Herring's guiding symptoms of Materia Medica. So I welcome him. Also, I would like to welcome our second speaker who will be discussing Organon of Medicine with us to have the chance to nurture students and enable them to ignite their own flame for learning is an essential aspect of teaching. And he, full, uh, and he is an expert in uh, this essential aspect of teaching. We have Dr. Alok Mishra, sir, who is an inspiration for so many, so many uh, uh, students and doctors all over uh, practitioners all over the uh, country. Uh, he's the assistant professor at Mahesh Bhattacharya uh, Homeopathic Medical College and Hospital, Government of West Bengal, and also an honorary physician uh, to the government, uh, to, to His Excellency, the Governor of West Bengal. I welcome Sir. He'll be discussing on the topic of disease classification. I hope everybody is with us and excited to learn from both of them. Now, uh, I won't waste any more time. I, people are excited. So I just want to hand over the session to Dr. Tarkeshwar, Sir. Please begin the session, sir. Over to you. Good afternoon to you all. Uh, thank you, Yashika, for the nice introduction. And thanks to the entire team of 360 Degree for promoting homeopathy in this phase of crisis where the uh, real classroom teaching is not taking place and people are earning their knowledge with the help of these kind of webinars. And 360 de Degree is certainly providing a good sound platform for the exchange of knowledge between various groups and teachers and colleges and universities. And that way you are really doing a great job in this time of crisis. So uh, today I'm going to discuss something about Natrium Viraticum. Although to say anything about Natrium Viraticum to the field of homeopathy is nothing very special, nothing very new because this is such a common remedy that uh, every one of us, whether we have started our practice or even we have been practicing for, for a long period of time, maybe 20, 30, 40 years, 
Natamiraticum is the one remedy which certainly comes in our practice, in our day-to-day -day practice. And uh, <clears throat> the knowledge about Natamiraticum is more or less apparent to everyone who is studying homeopathy or who is practicing homeopathy. So there is nothing new which, which I can offer to the field in the form of Natamiraticum. Uh, but still, I wanted to work upon it. I wanted to talk about this remedy because there are certain interesting things. There are certain interesting points that I have observed in my practice while working with this remedy. This is indeed a polycrest remedy. And uh, every day, uh, if you have a good practice, even if you are seeing 10, 15 patients per day, every day we may find one at least one patient who might be requiring natrimiraticum and this is also one of uh, one of the nice endeavor of the team 360 degree that they are uh, keeping discussions and the deliberations on uh, common and polycrest remedies which are very frequently used in practice because nowadays everyone is rushing towards the newer remedies and what new you have in your treasury that is what now have become the uh, status point and a point of satisfaction in every every homeopathic uh, clinics or every homeopathic doctor's uh, treasury that how many new remedies you knew but uh, unfortunately i would say because i am interacting with many students regularly i'm interacting with the resident doctors regularly and uh, unfortunately i would say that still uh, there are a need for refreshing the knowledge about polycrest remedy. That is, this is always required because when we discuss in groups, when we talk upon the cases, upon the live cases itself, and we find that still many of our student resident doctors, even the learned homeopathic doctors are not able to differentiate or to draw a fine line difference between the two closely running polycrest remedies. Because still there are certain things or there are few focal points few core phenomena that every remedy possesses <clears throat> and if those core phenomena are not present in the remedy you cannot say that your prescription is a similimum according to any manian way so i always feel there is always a need to talk more and more about polycrest remedy because these are the remedies which are covering most of our practices rare remedies or the new remedies <clears throat> are needed in practice but as the name suggests, rare remedy. So the rare the remedy is and the rare the use is. Otherwise, most of our practices are governed by the common and polycrest remedies. And it is always a good phenomena to refresh your knowledge about the common and polycrest remedy. And Natrimiraticum is one of the biggest remedy that we have in our practice. But why I wanted to discuss uh, with the field about this remedy is something that I observed and sometimes some, some information which I uh, came to know and eventually I verified in my practice also when I, when I started studying Metromedica with the help of herring guiding symptoms. As we all know that herring guiding symptom is one of the most prominent work ever done in Metromedica. Perhaps this is the most complete work that we have in the field. But unfortunately, although it is the part of syllabus of almost every teaching institute, part of CCS syllabus, but unfortunately, till the final year, or even I have seen uh, many batches of uh, postgraduate scholars, PhD scholars, who has not gone through herring guiding symptom till, till the time. They have been practicing homeopathy for 20 years, or they have been teaching homeopathy for 20 years, but still they are unaware about the construction, about the style, about the quality, about the contents of herring guiding symptom. And this is something really unfortunate. Why I would say unfortunate, because there are many things which are present in the herring guiding symptom, but are either it is being mispresented or it is being not presented anywhere in the up uh, in the forthcoming literature and the literature that evolved after herring's work. At many places, many uh, beautiful things has quoted, narrated, written, but unfortunately is still not finding the proper place in many of the repertories or metromedica. This is the one aspect. And another aspect is that uh, many people who has uh, worked upon herring or who has somehow borrowed the material from the herring. I would say that uh, all the metro medicals that has evolved after herring guiding symptoms are some or other way are having the baseline or the foundation in the herring guiding symptom itself. If we talk about the most common accepted popular metro medica, 
available in the uh, homeopathic system is uh, lectures on homeopathic matter medica by James Tyler Kent because I consider that to be the most popular matter medica that we have in our system and uh, the beautiful description Kent gives to every remedy is uh, uh, highly uh, appreciable and easily imbibable you when any 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 student or any scholar who study Kent's matter medica can easily feel the remedy by itself in every aspect not only in the mental or emotional aspect but on the physical symptoms or the symptoms at the level of part or the clinical diagnosis clinical symptom everything is very well accumulated in Kent's lectures of matter medica and similar things are available in the repertory of Kent both are uh, uh, beautiful contribution of Kent to the field but uh, if you go through the lesser writing of the Kent and if you go to the introduction of the uh, lectures on Metamedica or to the introduction of Kent's repertory, he simply acknowledged that his work is majorly based on herring guiding symptom. Uh, the most of the thing that he talks about in uh, in Metamedica or he talks about in the repertory are taken up as such from the herring guiding symptom. Certainly, he has added his own clinical experience also. That is also a very important. Uh, contribution he has made and it is the compilation of uh, the work done by the herring guiding symptom and then his personal experience that he has gathered uh, out of his clinical practice and that is how Kent's lecture on Metro Medica has evolved and the Kent's repertory has evolved and not only that but uh, beside many other beside Kent also many other teachers and scholars and the readers and the authors who came after herring some or other way in their matter medica or in their repertory they have a have a base of herring guiding symptom so this is such a complete book of uh, matter medica but unfortunately as i say that most of the time this work has remained ignored and many of us still don't know what is the description of herring guiding symptom and how is the plan and constitution and the construction of herring guiding symptom so when i started my teaching as early in 2001 i was definitely focused on the <clears throat> common matter medica that we use in phoenix also borix matter medica or allen's keynotes or cortex matter medica or kent's lectures on matter medica but as in how i kept on growing in my studies i kept on growing in my teaching i needed some more work to be uh, exposed and uh, one some more work to be taken care of and eventually i came in contact with the many new authors also like the work of etholkas work of rajan sankaran work of philip bailey Many, many such authors, new authors also kept adding in my library and I kept on studying them also and study of Metamedica with the help of periodic table. This is this was also a very big interest in my teaching and my reading also. And I started working on periodic table also and I delivered many lectures in different parts of India and other places about the how you can study or how you can improve the knowledge of your Metamedica with the help of periodic table. And that was one very important field and interesting field for me. But over and over, when I kept on reading all these articles, I could I could relate that some or other way, every teaching is somehow getting a base from the herring guiding symptoms. So I thought that when I am reading all these books every now and then, then why why not I should focus more on the herring guiding symptom? And then eventually, uh, in around somewhere around 2011-12. I started, although I have been studying herring guiding symptom earlier too, but not too precisely as I started doing in 2011-12, I started working on herring guiding symptom. And uh, we made uh, many uh, research projects also, many research modulations also with the help of herring guiding symptoms. We studied common remedies, we studied many uncommon remedies also. And uh, I would say that uh, there was there was many interesting things that, that I was really many times I was really astonished that how these things are available in herring guiding symptoms and not still available in many of the uh, the further literature that came to the field. It was really astonishing to me also. I would quote some of the examples while I am talking about Natrum eraticum. Now, why Natrum eraticum? Because we understand Natrum eraticum as a remedy of uh, uh, a constitutional remedy par excellence certainly it has certain uh, physical appearance a kind of uh, a, a physical presentation threat 
there are many important uh, physical general symptoms in the form of likings and aversions sensations there are many many variety of symptoms are there beside being one of the very major and prominent remedy for the people who are emotionally vulnerable or those who are highly sensitive at the part of emotions and once they are being injured at the le level of emotions at the level of mind uh, their life experience major, major changes a major shift from their previous life to the current life which are resulting after the after the injuries on emotional place and they are highly vulnerable people at the part at the part of emotions and uh, this is all we know very well and whenever we talk about natrium muriaticum suddenly an image pop up in our mind as if it is a natrium muriaticum certainly there would be a history of grief there would be a history of disappointment and now we are dealing with a patient who is absolutely closed who is not willing to open at all and we have to do a great deal of efforts to bring this patient live in our clinic to say them something to open the mouth because these are considered as to be the most closed personality which we encounter in our day to practice day practice natumeraticum is indeed a very big broad remedy and uh, it has it has uh, almost every kind of element ranging from acute illness to the chronic status ranging from a common cold and coryza to the rheumatoid disorders or the autoimmune disorders or the malignant situations everything is very well Uh, covered by natumeraticum this is such a deep acting chronic remedy so everything is there but uh, whenever we think about natumeraticum we certainly take care of uh, mental and emotional aspects along with the important physical generals and the image that natumeraticum carries in our mind is that uh, natumeraticum is someone the moment uh, we we talk we think about natumeraticum immediately flash comes in our mind the natumeraticum is this someone who is totally drowned in grief who is always in the state of sadness in the state of depression in the state of negativity in the state of joylessness and these are the people who are always closed and never willing to show up their emotions never willing in by any way neither by talking or nor by expressing themselves in the form of tears or conversation because those are the things which eventually any kind of consolation any kind of uh, uh, a push to poke them rather aggravates them this is what we have been studying so far and this is what i amaze the natumeraticum carries in our mind a sensitive girl a sensitive lady a sensitive man who gets hurt easily and once he is hurt once she is hurt he is absolutely closed and now there is no way out to 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 release the, uh, their emotions release their expressions and they remain in their own shell they don't prefer company that is what the picture that we see about the natrium muriaticum but uh, when we when we go through the work of herring guiding symptoms and when we start reading the mind section of herring guiding symptom and the very first line that herring writes about natumeraticum contradicts the emis this is what i wanted to uh, discuss about you about the with the fraternity fraternity with the students with the teachers about the natumeraticum i have been doing this earlier also through uh, many lectures in different places and i am i am trying to draw attention of anti fraternity about this aspect of natrium muriaticum which i feel is misrepresented at many places i don't say that whatever we study about natrium muriaticum or we have been studying about uh, natrium muriaticum in different books like uh, whether it is the kent's lectures or elensky notes or the fatex metromedica or even the new work done by the withalkers or the sankaran or the philip belly or the many other teachers the robin murphy or uh, uh, roser morris whatever whoever whatever work they have done they are somewhere all are right i i'm not saying that anyone has done a wrong work or anyone has misrepresented uh, natrium muriaticum but if we compare with the herring guiding symptoms and if we go through the mental state of antiviraticum through the herring guiding symptom then there are certain things which uh, uh, which raise a question that is it true that whatever picture that we have 
created about natin varieticum is 100% you is it uh, is it uh, or do we find a need to reexamine the natum varieticum in the context of what herring guiding in, in symptom has quoted in the mental section of the natum varieticum is there any need to rediscuss to investigate the things further and to bring out a comprehensive metromedica where the herring guiding symptom is also on the background this is what i perceived and what i analyzed when i have been uh, studying natum varieticum with the help of herring guiding symptoms and then now i begin my presentation with this introduction and uh, uh, I would say in natum varieticum uh, herring guiding symptom it was of course introduced and proved by Hanneman and himself but uh, this is again a beauty of herring guiding symptom which I generally don't see in many of the matter medica and that is what uh, create an authenticity about this work uh, because when you begin the remedying herring guiding symptom first it says not only about the prover, but the information that is being gathered in herring guiding symptom. What are the sources from where this information has come to this book? This is something very important. So Hanimanen was definitely the master prover of herring guiding symptom, but the uh, sorry natum varieticum. But it's not the Hanimanen who has worked on natum varieticum. Beside him, there were many other schools and teachers who has worked extensively on natrium varieticum and the this is the beauty of herring guiding symptom that he has kept information and resources about all those not only the work of any menon is being presented in the book but beside that those who were contemporaries to him any menon or who were being assisted or who assisted to the any menon in the, his work of proving of natrium varieticum are also being being given the due place and names and many other uh, societies or many other places where the natrium varieticum proving was done and they are being incorporated in the herring guiding symptom so this is the beauty of herring guiding symptom he has acknowledged every contributor for any remedy that has taken place in herring guiding symptom so this is something very important and fortunately i would say that most of the present teachers or most of the present matter medica none of them are mentioning the sources from about or for about they are talking they are talking about various things they are talking about the many themes they are talking about the stages of remedies they are talking about the mental and emotional aspects and how these stages of remedies primary stage second stage third stage how that is affecting to the human body they are talking a lot about various things but uh, what is the base of their literature what is the fundamental uh, source of their information is not mentioned in their books. This is really unfortunate. Even if you talk about any present day new mathematica, they talk a lot. They draw a very beautiful picture, a flimsy picture of a portrait of a remedy. And uh, and you, you get uh, mesmerized when you study remedy with these books and you feel that, oh, my God, this is the this is the area of which I am still unaware. Such a beautiful poultry of the remedy is being done in the beautiful words in the articulated manner. And you as you feel yourself mesmerized, you feel yourself astonished. But uh, the unfortunate part is when you go in the practice and we, when you don't observe such stages, such themes in your practice and you feel quite disappointed on that time. Because many of the work presented in Petri Medica are based, I think, on their individual perception, on their individual experience, but not on the fundamentals of various sources. Uh, it's more limited to their personal experience. While if you talk about the work done in the herring guiding symptom that is based on the sources, on the clinical provings that are being done on that time. And not only that, because if you see in this screen, it was introduced by the Hanneman himself, but it was he was being assisted by Fossek, Rawl, Rummel, Schreiter, and Nanning. These were the immediate disciples of Hanneman, who had been closely working on that time also with Hanneman. But beside that, Henry Herring has also included the work of Austrian Austrian provers. There is a there is a society of Austrian homeopathic society available on that time, and they have also worked quite. Uh, uh, comprehensively on natrium varieticum. Farrington has done 
a good work on natrium baryticum. Barrys has done a good work on natrium baryticum. He has also conducted proving of natrium baryticum. Robinson has uh, published his proving in the British Journal of Homeopathy in volume 25. And that work is being also taken up in herring guiding symptoms. So he clearly mentioned in the beginning of every remedy that what are the fundamental sources for this particular remedy. Then another beauty about herring guiding symptom is that whatever work that is being included in herring guiding symptom is being clinically verified multiple times, not only for the one or two times or not only based on the individual experience, the symptoms which are being taken up, which are being kept in herring guiding symptoms have come from the sources of proving, but they are being repeatedly clinically verified by various authorities. And that's how that's how this become the most authentic source of knowledge for Met America. So it is my earnest request to every student, to every PG and PhD scholar, every teacher who is teaching Mathematica in their college. Please don't ignore this work because till date, I say till date, this is the work which is most authentic in the field of Mathematica. Rest all the Mathematica that you see. Whether even if you talk about the Kent's lecture of Mathematica, he has given beautiful portrait of various remedy undoubtedly and his experience, clinical experience was very rich, very high. But still, there are many symptoms which are based on his individual perception, on his individual perception, like one symptom that he mentioned about uh, when we talk about the natrium viraticum, where he mentions that natrium viraticum is a remedy for the sensitive girls who are uh, having a tendency to develop unrequited affections, unrequited affections. They are the sensitive girls who can fall for the person who is of much higher than their age or who is a married man or who is a coachman. He has given the, uh, uh, the, the term coachman also, the one who is coaching them, tutoring them, or the one who is already marrying. And these are the sensitive girls who falls, who are emotionally so sensitive, who falls for a married person. And they always think about them. They are dreaming about that person. And they deeply go inside the feelings for those, those person. This is the, the, this, this is the description that Kent gives when he is talking about Natrium Baryticum in, in, in his Mathematica. Now, this is totally his personal experience. I don't say he is wrong because many times we have clinically confirmed those things in our practice. Also, many of you might have also confirmed, although I won't say that much of these kind of females I have inquired in my practice where they fall for uh, uh, the person or especially Natrium Baryticum we talk about falling for the people of the their mature is or unrequited factions but this was his personal experience and if you go back and try to trace out these feelings in hearing guiding symptom you don't find any such clue which talk about such kind of unrequited affection so many teachers have added their personal experience and i don't say that they are wrong in their perceptions but uh, if you talk about herring guiding symptom there are a different kind of image that you see in a, in a natrium viraticum which we usually don't observe many times in our typical natrium viraticum subject and why this is uh, this becomes an important document because if you see herring after covering the list of provers who has contributed for the proving of herring guiding symptoms uh, uh, proving of natrium viraticum and then finally to be incorporated in herring guiding symptom. Beside that, he gives a list of all the articles, major articles, not all the articles, but major important articles which have been published during that time. So there are, if you open the chapter of natrium viraticum, there are more than 200 articles he has mentioned. He has given the name of article. He has given the name of author. He has given where it was being published who was the author and what was the, even the page number is clearly depicted and written on the page itself. And this, if you talk about the Natrium Viraticum, he has given the references of more than 200 articles existed on that time. Those articles which were being published by in American Journal of Homeopathy or in the British Journal of Homeopathy, which were the leading journals in uh, his time. He has given the reference of those articles also. And this is how 
we can rely on the work and we can say yes because he has given all the sources all the information and unfortunately till that none of the mathematica none of the mathematica has so comprehensively given the reference not even the kent even the kent if you talk about the lectures on mathematica of kent he has also not given this much of references from where the he has worked upon whether the work was his individual experience or he is incorporated from other resources nothing is being mentioned even the kent's lecture of mathematica and if you talk about the vitalkas work or sankaran or philip belly none of them are acknowledging from where they have got these sources what are the sources when they are talking about the different images different stages different themes about the mathematica what are the sources do we have the real sources real time sources from where we can link and we can go back and see these symptoms are appearing in the proving this is a big question now it is because uh, everybody is talking in their own way when we talk about the mathematica and this is happening everywhere and nowadays we have started practicing merely on the base of assumption we simply presume something that if we take a toxic material and something something will happen to us some sort of toxic symptoms would start appearing in us and eventually that particular substance if we potentize and we ingest it will be able to cure us now this is this is all based on assumption only metamedica any remedy that is coming to the metamedica there are certain fundamental rules there are certain fundamental principle which can make a remedy to be included in metamedica and the basic rule is drug proving and unfortunately nowadays metamedica is thickly growing with the inclusion of many smaller remedies which are being incorporated in metamedica only be only on the basis of either individual experience or just on the basis of assumptions that in a line 17 vertical line of periodic table we have halogen compounds and halogen compounds are having a tendency of uh, creating a great spasm in the respiratory center so that the remedies which are given in the uh, halogen line or in the 17 line would be able to treat and heal those kind of spasm uh, coming to the respiratory centers now these are all assumptions unless the remedy is being proven on a healthy human being in the strict parameters that are being guided by our teachers and even in himself and merely on the basis of assumption that this might be the reaction and we start giving that medicine to the patient is a wrong practice indeed and nowadays it is happening very fast just on the basis of assumption we starting introducing remedies in our metamedica which is doing more harm than good to the system and it is my request to is unless the remedy is being been proven in a systematic manner because when you prove the remedies any man and during any man's times also there was many remedies which have come from the field of toxicology like arsenicum album or mercury they all came from the toxicological accidents but he has conducted a proving and included metamedica in metamedica only after conducting the proving only after confirming those remedies multiple times on the human beings then only it it could occupy the place in metamedica itself not just on the base, basis of assumptions or on the basis of just toxicological finding and you add the remedy in metamedica that was not done in the animals time but nowadays it is happening quite frequently because when we prove the remedy when we prove the remedy there are many new symptoms coming up not just the toxicological symptoms but many other new symptoms are coming up which are even more important that we relate with the toxicology it's not always essential that the symptoms related to toxicological findings are the basis of applying that particular remedy in practice no many time the symptoms are coming in the proving which are having beautiful expressions beautiful expression which are not available even in the in the toxicology expression at the level of mind and emotions expression at the level of other physical entities and which are more important than the symptoms of toxicological so the the proving is the only base to include any remedy in metamedica and just barely on the basis of assumption if you include the me medicine in your metamedica is uh, always a doubtful state so these are some of the uh, the examples given in herring binding although the list is with quite big more than 200 clinical notes and articles are given in the book itself uh, describing about uh, uh, about the uh, about the conception about the symptomatology of natum baryticum
So now when we talk about Netum Viraticum, certainly there are a few things that comes in our mind, uh, not only about the mental aspect, but about the physical aspect also, about, about the appearance also. Because in our, this is the beauty of Metamedica rather, that we can, we can see our remedies, we can perceive our remedies just by seeing the patient first time, just by the physical appearance. Because in our totality, in our uh, construction of uh, totality of symptom, everything has uh, its own uh, own uh, weight its own value and uh, we make totality on the basis of physical appearance on the basic of gestures on the basis of uh, their nature on the basis of how the present patient is presenting himself and on the basis of core findings of their internal state of emotions and mind and then relating all those symptoms or confirming all those symptoms with the help of their uh, physical general, the thermal reaction, their likings and aversions, and finally we erect a totality. So uh, when we talk about natrium or when a typical natrium subject is coming to us, there are a few things which are interesting, which we all know very well. And just by seeing the face, just by looking uh, towards the person itself, and many there are many constitutional features which are available in natrium also, which can which can uh, make you understand that yes this person can be a probable subject for netum and uh, there are certain certain guiding guiding clues i think you all know about that i'm, uh, I'm telling you nothing new that the uh, the crack in the middle of lower lip you can see is uh, one of the one of the feature one of the very important feature of netum uh, constitutional appearance or a physical appearance and another beautiful feature which is being uh, listed in many metamedicas also and which is being listed in herring guiding symptom also that there are sometimes or uh, there are transverse creases in the lower eyelid of uh, a patient the first patient or the young girls or the sensitive girls who present transverse creases in the lower eyelids are many times uh, are subject to the and etymeraticum or there are possibility of these people to be eventually come out as netomeraticum although i always say that they don't block yourself just by the mere presence of any uh, physical appearance unless you go through the entire case you go understand everything and then only open your mind for any particular remedy don't block yourself but these are some of the presenting threats which are found in a netomeraticum individual and many times they are needed to confirm our remedy that we have gone through the entire aspect of netomeraticum emotional and mental aspect and eventually then when we have to confirm the remedy then these are some of the attributes which can help you to confirm the remedy so transverse creases in the lower eyelid area and the a crack in the middle of lower lip, a deep crack in the middle of lower lip is many times diagnostic for natrium And there are many such remedies which can be, which can, uh, which have these kind of typical physical appearance or the facial appearance. And you, you just by seeing those, those signs and you can make out that perhaps there are, or you can confirm your remedy with the help of those signs like uh, if we, we talk about ethuda synapium there is a silver uh, lining across the lips or in between the uh, nasal folds and lips there is a silver lining which is a constitutional presentation of ethuda synapium and if you talk about the lycopodium also we have uh, a, a tendency to frown these this area is deeply frowned and many times the area between the two eyebrows are having deep furrows deep furrows between the eyebrows and the deep furrows on the forehead are many times the diagnostic features of lycopodium also and you can presume that the subject can be lycopodium so there are many many such the short head and the, or the person without neck as if the head is being placed directly on the trunk and the god has forgot to create neck is many times a constitutional appearance of uh, Kelly remedies. Kelly remedies are having this thread that they are devoid of neck as if the head is being directly placed on the trunk or when the patient's head size is large we have many remedies which can uh, give us clue about certain kind of uh, remedies or 
like uh, uh, the the tip on the uh, what tip or uh, tip of what on the tip of nose is many time a, a distinguishing feature of causticum so these these symptoms also have or these appearance also have some of their roles in the decision of final decision of metamedica when you have to confirm the remedies many time these these indications are helping us so these are some of the indication although for natrium eraticum we also say that this is the lady or the person who has a long neck long neck a long neck is also a characteristic feature of uh, uh, natrium eraticum but if you go in the herring guiding symptom he also talk about the long neck but he he says that the 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 necks are becoming weak and emaciated it's not always the long neck he says that the necks are usually uh, emaciated and become weak or the flesh part is very less in neck especially during summer complaints he says many times and it's not that all the time the natumeraticum neck is emaciated whenever they are suffering from summer complaints like if they are suffering from diarrhea or vomiting or anything which is causing loss of vital fluids especially in summer season this makes their neck emaciated this is what is written in herring guiding symptom so he is not about the opinion that every time the neck of natumeraticum patient is emaciated all the time no it's only during the summer complaints and i tell you there are many such symptoms where herring has decidedly decisively given that this particular mental or emotional symptom is appearing only in a particular situation and unfortunately afterwards the authors have made those symptoms a generalized one like if i talk about uh, 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 a symptom of antim crudum we all know about the antim crude child that they are peevish and cross antimonium child doesn't want you to look towards him they are quite cross and peevish especially when somebody is paying attention towards them they be they become cranky they become annoyed if somebody is looking at them if somebody is giving attention and they become cross they don't answer in a civil manner and they they are annoyed whenever they, they grab any attention they become annoyed they become cross they become peevish they become snappish especially when any stranger is looking towards them but if you open the herring guiding symptom and if you open the chapter in antimonium crude you will find that this particular symptom is available in herring guiding symptom only when the baby is suffering from some gastric disturbance this is the beauty of herring guiding symptom if anybody of you have gone through this book you might have noted that after writing any particular symptom and if that particular symptom is related with a clinical condition he plays a theta in between like cross and ugly child sensitive to looks sensitive or aversion to looks theta is there and then he has written during the gastric complaint that means that crossness of baby that snappish behavior that aversion towards the looks and attention appears in antimonium crude child only when they are suffering from gastric disturbance now this is what is a beautiful thing herring has done then when in a particular situation when in a particular clinical condition this kind of emotional or mental symptom is appearing it is not only about the emotional or mental symptom wherever you go in the herring guiding symptom he has placed theta among the many condition that means that that particular symptom is found only in that particular state it is not as general phenomena but unfortunately the authors who came later on even allen's keynote if you open up and there also he has made this symptom entirely general and that's why many time we fail in practice because we don't find such kind of symptom antimonium all the time it is available only when the baby is suffering from some gastric problem when he is suffering from diarrhea or vomiting or some and something related to gastric part and then only they develop this kind of symptom of being annoyed irritable cross ugly that is the situation but every author whether it is allens or pathak or any other author coming up they have made this symptom quite a general one everyone says their antimonium child they are quite cross ugly snappish peevish averse to stranger averse to looks everyone 
but this is not true if you go back to the erring item symptom there is a clinical condition like in arnica also we say that arnica is a remedy as the person who says that there is nothing the matter with him there is nothing the matter with him everything is fine with him and we immediately think of arnica and many authors have described only this symptom in such a long way that they have they have developed an entire personality of arnica only on the basis of this symptom that there is nothing the matter with them they say that arnica is a very confident individual a very domineering individual he is like a military general he will never acknowledge any of his weakness he will never say that i am a weak person i am a strong general military general i am i am i am a quite domineering personality only on the basis of this symptom because they have a feeling they say that there is nothing the matter with them they don't ex they don't express their feelings they say that they are always in command there is nothing the matter with them but if you open the hearing dying to symptom my dear friends you will be surprised to note that this particular symptom of arnica there is nothing the matter with him only appears during some infective fever it's not a generalized condition about arnica nowhere written in the hearing guiding symptom that arnica has a generalized threat of saying that they are absolutely all right all the time they have nothing the matter with them everything is fine with them no it's written it appears only when the person is suffering from any kind of septic or infective fever then only this symptom has appeared and then only this has been clinically verified but authors have made it such a general symptom that only on the basis of this particular symptom they have evolved the entire personality of arnica now this is this is somewhat i really wish to talk about and i really wish to uh, to share with the profession also that when you go back to the herring game testing because that is the basis of every matter medica and when you go back and then only you find that there are many such symptoms which are presented in a different form and they are described in upcoming matter medica in a very different way so that's 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 not the right thing which i which i feel we should definitely stick to the provings to the clinical confirmation not only not on the basis of individual personal ideas about the remedy that should not be the case so this was uh, just a bit of information about the uh, about the appearance of netumbriticum and then we talk about the about the child of netumbriticum what kind of children we have in uh, netumbriticum and uh, as you can see that uh, if you talk about the child of netumbriticum and there are also certain uh, conflicts between the image that we perceive in our metamedicas and the image that is being portrayed in herring guiding symptom if you talk about the child of netumbriticum and if you go through the description of herring and this is what i observed in my practice also that these are not so well behaved child they have lots of irritability issues lots of temperamental issues they have great irritability child is irritable and cross when is spoken to like that you see in the antimonium crudum but in antimonium crudum it is only during a one particular situation when he is suffering from a gastric problem but in natrum bryticum this is the behavior of child they are irritable child they gets irritated quite easily and cross irritable and cross when is spoken the moment you try to speak with them the moment you try to converse with them and they start becoming more cross more irritable and crying for slightest cause just the silliest thing just the silliest thing is enough to make them cry now this weeping crying these are the essential component of netumbriticum and as in how we will go further in the symptom you will come to note that this is not related all the time with the situations of life or with the situation of grief or insults or indignation or the vexation or the chagrin no it's not always related with them it's it's the fundamental nature of netumbriticum subject to have a tendency to weep to cry and this depends uh, in childhood this this reservation is not there that they are going in a in a separate room and uh, making the room dark and sitting in a in a corner of the room and then they start releasing their tears and listening the sad and mellow music the music that makes them more sad than before and they keep drowning in their own sadness and then they start crying and crying and crying this might be the state but in the more so in the adolescence or in the adult stages but in the children you won't find such kind of phenomena in netumbriticum they can cry 
from the slightest cause just a little thing is enough to make them cry and they will start crying on the on the silliest matter and very ill humored in morning you don't mess with an atomeraticum child in the morning because they are they, they will not talk civilly their humor they are quite ill humored they will bite you if you start uh, messing up with them in the morning especially when they are waking up from the bed and their time is quite difficult and many females come to our clinic and say that it's very difficult to get hold on this child especially in morning time because i this is the time when i have to rush for all the works and this is the time when i have to make him ready for the schools I have to I have to feed him breakfast I have to feed him milk but this child is totally uncooperative especially during the during the morning time and more i try to make him understand more he becomes worse it's very difficult to manage this child what should i do i really don't understand what should i do in the morning time because more i try to manage him more i try to pacify him he becomes more aggressive so they have lots of temperamental issues from the very beginning from the early childhood natomeraticum child are like this only quarrelsome fretfulness very much always ready to fight with you and their fretfulness fret fret word is taken up from the from the chords of guitar you know the five wires of guitar they are called fret and the moment you touch the one fret and the music comes out so that kind of easiness that kind of sensitivity netum reticum child is the moment you poke them the moment you touch them and they will immediately start reacting they will immediately start crying or become irritable or become angry and gets into patient about the people the silliest thing the silliest thing is enough to bring them angry to make them passionate passionate vehemence any kind of thing and it comes with force it's not coming with the mildness no it's coming with the force to so say their expressions of anger irritability are not suppressed in childhood are not hidden they are freely expressive of their anger of their emotions of their Uh, tears they are not hiding it and hateful and vindictive by nature it is again the part of natumeraticum personality although people portray a beautiful image of natumeraticum that they are so resilient they are so well behaved they will always appear calm and mild and they will take hold of every emotion inside they will not react and you will even not come to know that what they are suffering inside is not always true about it. natumeraticum if you go in the hearing guiding symptoms and you will find that this is again a trait of natumeraticum to be revengeful they have their own way of taking revenge they have their own way of expressing hatefulness they have their own way of showing the vindictiveness they have their own ways but they have this inside they have this inside you may not be able to perceive you you may find that natumeraticum people say that if you have a natumeraticum individual in the family you are blessed because they will not react about anything whatever they are suffering they are keeping inside nothing is coming out so you 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 like you enjoy the company of such individuals but that's not the entire story about natumeraticum if you go through the hearing guiding symptom you will find many such symptoms which are not corroborating with this kind of image of natumeraticum that we see in the further mathematicas that they are always mild calm gentle and always in control natumeraticum always in control and they will not reflect anything they will you will not be able to take any any clue that whether they are suffering inside or not but it's not true they have many many kind of traits of expressing themselves and they the basic thing that that comes or that you can sense if you are a little diligent of you if, if you are a little sensitive homeopathic doctor a little sensitive homeopathic doctor you will be able to sense a kind of irritability a kind of irritability in their behavior a kind of uh, chagrin a kind of annoyance annoying annoyance in your behavior you will be able to reflect it if you are diligent enough they are not always mild and controlled individuals the sense of irritability is there in their behavior in their way of uh, uh, communicating in their way of expressing in their way of even in the eyes you can find that kind of trait in the natumeraticum so it's not always a controlled individual and the same is there in child also is a child also they are quite hateful and vindictive and revengeful also if there somebody has troubled them somebody has caused any problem to them then they really make it a point to take revenge by any means and uh, beside being a prominent uh, soric remedy natumeraticum is also a psychotic 
having a strong psychotic background and which which makes a kind of uh, uh, threat in them of being manipulative also so they can plan they can manipulate and they can take their revenge even as a child and uh, when you trying to comfort them they gets into violent rage this is the uh, this is the basic phenomena or the basic trait of natum reticum that any kind of consolation any kind of uh, uh, reassurance is always unwelcome although when you look at the natum reticum when you look at the natum reticum person feel that perhaps this person need sympathy perhaps this person need sympathy the look are like this you will find their eyes are wet always wet if you look in the natomeraticum eyes they have the wet eyes staring eyes always but the hold of emotions or the control is so strong this is a voluntary control that do that they do that the tears are not rolling out like in pulsatilla or phosphorus tears are rolling out just a slight provocation just a slight reassurance and then they will burst up they will open up even without reassurance pulse tilla is always ready to open up graphitis is always ready to open up but pulse netum reticum even if you push them you more push them they will become more inward so you assume that when you look to the patient you feel that perhaps this person needs help even to the baby you may assume that this person this baby needs help this person this this person needs a caressing hand needs a sympathetic hand needs a warm hug and the moment you try to hug them or give a warm they will boom become more aggressive this is what the natum reticum is is it is a kind of hysterical attitude i would say it is a kind of hysterical attitude and this is perhaps the one word hysteria or the hysterical tendency around which the entire natum reticum is running you feel the moment you see you feel that this person is needing sympathy and it is my utmost duty to offer my consolation to this person because i can understand this person is suffering because their 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 reflections are like this their their uncontrolled involuntary reflection of natum reticum are like this that you feel yes this person need help but the moment you try to render help they will immediately shut them off they will be more closed now and you won't be able to help them at all because if you try to do that they will show more aggression they will become more aggressive so this is present even in a childhood state even in the children's mental aspect mental emotions you will find this kind of threat the moment you try to comfort them they become more aggressive anthropophobia another point of natum reticum they have a dread of meeting people they have a dread of uh, uh, human beings rather you would say and especially it is written about the that female is having aversion to meet male subjects or the aversion to have the male company so they are afraid of uh, uh, crowdy places they are afraid of uh, uh, meeting people they are rather afraid of the human entity they are not so much comfortable in company and this is their basic nature it's not if you if an adult is coming to us and if somebody says that i am having an aversion to company and then you start relating oh because this is a poor subject she had so many disappointment in the life so many shocks so many accidents in the life especially on the mental and emotional aspect and now she has become averse to company no it's not you if you own if you even overview the childhood of natum reticum subject you would come to know that even as a children even as a small children who has not undergone any kind of disappointment any kind of emotional accident any kind of vulnerability no they still he is like this even because this is a trait of natum reticum so don't confound natum reticum with the with the symptom that he is averse to company because he has gone through many emotional injuries no it's not always true this is their basic fundamental nature they don't like company they are like this individual they are dread of people they are not very comfortable while meeting with the people they are better alone they don't like company much and this is their trait this is their constitutional fundamental trait which may have been inherited uh, through the generation or related with their past life this is their basic trait you cannot change it this is like this and it's not always necessary that this trait or this phenomena is connected with some some uh, some causative factor not not always there it, it is present in them like this only
fearfulness very easily starts yes they are always full of fears and uh, they 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 get startles easily the moment in fact netrembryatic child as a child also an adult also they are extremely sensitive to any kind of stimuli any kind of stimuli whether it is noise whether it is odor or whether it is environmental changes electrical changes in the environment sudden noise sudden knocks sudden touch strong odor they are sensitive to everything the sensitivity level of netembryaticum is very high sensitive to any kind of internal as well as external stimuli they react to all the things they react but these reactions are of course involved it's not the outward reactions but as a child you can see that these reactions are quite open as in how they grow old they mature they start becoming learning the the process of closing themselves entirely and perhaps this is the i will explain later also perhaps this is the one way of grabbing the attention also because this might also be a hysterical attitude of netemuratic and that to close yourself to bring yourself in the shell is one of the biggest ideas to grab the attention of the individuals because you know that you are uh, you are closed you are not communicating with the people you remain in your own shell even if you are suffering a lot inside is it gives a kind of satisfaction it gives a kind of pride feeling in them that yes i am the one who is not like pulsatilla or graphitis who is always bombarding emotions outwardly you know see i am see myself i am such a such an individual who has a capacity to hold the emotion and this is a matter of pride for them eventually if you see the netemuraticum these are those are coming in the adulthood or in the adolescent stages you will find these kind of phenomena so these are the reflections of child so what i mean to say that if you open the eyes i don't say the netemuraticum child is are not well behaved but not always this is not their basic trait of being well behaved this is again their hysterical trait so many mathematicals this is where the conflict lies many mathematicals are saying the netemuraticum child are very well behaved and disciplined and responsible individuals very well behaved whether you open with holcus a sense of a sense of a sense of mathematica whether you go through the work of uh, that desktop guide of roger morrison whether you study in philip valley everywhere you would you would find the mentioning of can didn't mention anything like this although he gives a little reflection that the the child are uh, disciplined and organized child but uh, all these mathematica that i am talking about have really given a quite a long description about the child that these children are quite responsible always quite responsible well behaved decent individuals not making any fights not making any quarrels and just holding the things and behave more than their is they are more matured or behave in a matured manner but this is not always true about netemuraticum if you go through the proving records if you go through the symptoms that appear in the provers i am not talking about any kind of false imagination or assumptions i am simply talking about the things which appeared during proving and which has been repeatedly clinically verified by multiple authors not just one or two author multiple authors who had verified these symptoms comprehensively in their mathematicals in their work and they say that this is not the story the story that we see about the child that not always well behaved as expressed in many recent mathematical rather the picture is reverse they are more cross irritable angry child even in allen's keynote you can see that when they he talk about the child he says the child is irritable by nature angry by nature cross the moment you try to make them comfort they become more aggressive they become more violent and the picture that we see in other mathematicals they, they repeatedly write the child is well behaved so this is where here the conflict lies i what i presume is a, again a kind of hysterical trait that prevails in netemuraticum since beginning this is again a hysterical attitude of child that even they they may appear well behaved and docile child but the moment you touch them the moment you poke them they come in their real demeanor they come in their real image that what actually they are basically these child are not well behaved responsible or disciplined individual this is a kind of shell that they have enveloped in themselves they appear to be 
they might appear to be well behaved child but eventually and basically these are irritable angry and cross child even you try to speak them more cross than endmonium crudum more cross than lycopodium lycopodium is a snappish child immediately reacts but netembriaticum child is even more angry and cross than lycopodium or many other remedies which are uh, anger remedies for children so this is the one aspect if we see as a child also netembriaticum has many things which are uh, not perfectly depicted in the further metamedicals and this is what i wanted to uh, bring uh, uh, to the field so what may lead to classical natrimuriaticum what are the causative factors that may lead to natrimuriaticum of course this is the remedy where the many symptoms because natrimuriaticum is one of the finest remedy that we have for the psychosomatic illness and that's the reason why they suffer from um, thyroid issues from the lifestyle disorders from the addison disease many 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 uh, autoimmune diseases they are suffering from and one of the major reason behind those sufferings are their psychological traits and what are the those causative factors which can lead to a classical natrimuriaticum is of course uh, fright anger vexation mortification or deserved displeasure these are the the common impact that an natrimuriaticum perceives in his life and leading to not only uh, the mental symptoms but also their reflection on the body parts their psychological impact their psychological suppressions or not relieving themselves not releasing themselves or keeping things uh, within or taking the inward route of all the emotions in order to be to be presented as a glorified individual eventually make them victim of many internal maladies this is one of the uh, the vicious circle of natrimuriaticum they want to be appear good they want to be appear an, as a controlled individual and in that exercise of of being noted as a controlled individual they are eventually eating away their own emotions inside they are keeping the emotions inside suppressing their emotions suppressing their feelings not sharing with anyone and eventually they become victim of many incurable internal maladies that is the one aspect of natrimuriaticum so these are some of the common causes which are listed in uh, uh, herring guiding symptom the consequences of fright anger vexation mortification or reserved displeasure are resulting into the natrimuriaticum full blown personality not only as a child but as a full blown personality these are some of the major causes although we have many remedies with a similar kind of uh, of the causative factors if we talk about stephysegria ignatia acid fos lycopodium causticum cpr pulsatilla all these remedies are having the similar kind of uh, causative factors but uh, as i always say in my lecture that the remedy becomes complete only when the reactions and cause are in hand in hand if you uh, if you clinch the reaction and leave the cause again you are having a half similimum and same way if you if you hit on the cause and you don't uh, follow the reaction then again there would be no remedy so the causes may be the underlying causes may be the same for uh, many remedies but what eventually we look at the how the reaction comes up in the rem how the how if it is ignatia then what will the what would be the reaction of ignatia out of these common causes or what will the reaction of pulsatilla of acid fos of causticum of lycopodium of uh, many other remedies which are having the similar causative background so unless you match the cause with reaction the remedy is not complete so these are the common causes but then important part is on the basis of causes what reaction is coming out that is the more important part so when we talk about the uh, about the mind of metamuriaticum uh, uh, as uh, uh, mentioned in herring guiding symptom i would again say as mentioned in herring guiding symptom you will be really amazed to know really amazed to know that when you open the chapter of herring guiding symptom in the mind section the first symptom that herring writes is weakness or loss of memory remembers nothings of yesterday this is quite surprising and astonishing to everyone who 
gets the first sight of herring guiding symptom when we talk about netimbriaticum chapter the first symptom that written in herring guiding symptom is weakness or loss of memory remembers nothing of yesterday now this totally change your mind that because you we always presume that netrombiaticum is the one who is always dwelling in the past occurrences always remaining in the past always remaining in the past and here uh, even when even in my earlier days in my earlier teaching when i used to uh, teach netrombiaticum i used to sing one song uh, the beautiful song one of the movie that hum us beete kal mein rehte hain yaadon ke sab jugno jangal mein rehte hain so that this this is this reflects that the person who is living in his past all the time the thoughts of past the thoughts of uh, dwelling on the past disagreeable occurrences there is one rubric in repertory also dwells on past disagreeable occurrences i will talk about this also in the coming slides as if they are living in their past and they are constantly thinking if many many mathematica say the netumbriaticum means the one who is brooding all the time they they even the many mathematicals have marked them the homeopathic brooder the one who is constantly brooding constantly grieving on the unpleasant things that has taken place in their life but uh, if you open the herring guiding symptom you amaze weakness or loss of memory remembers nothing of your study so not brooding all the time rather many times they don't remember what has happened with them what incidents has taken place with them many time they are not even aware of those things in their general life in their routine life they appear quite normal it's not that they are always grieving all the time they are grieving it's not like that it's not that they are constantly brooding over the mishappenings or the unpleasant events that took place or the one of the disappointment or the one who left them or disappointed in a relationship it's not that they are always grieving with all those things in a normal life rather they don't remember all those things they are not even aware of it's only the situations it's only the situation which bring back their memory or many time even they do it voluntarily just to feel themselves sad just to become more emotional just to grieve they recall the event it's not that they are dwelling constantly they are rather recalling that whatever bad has taken with them whatever bad has taken place in their past life they voluntarily do it i would explain later on in uh, further slides also that what exactly happens but it's not it's wrong that they are constantly brooding rather many times the memory is so weak that they don't remember even the yesterday events weakness of memory is one of the strong characteristic feature of netumbriaticum absent minded or distracted while talking they cannot focus upon the things and they, they even while talking their their subject changes they be, become distracted their focus is lost from one particular topic and they many time misspells the words also doesn't know what he ought to say many time they just simply stops because they are not finding the correct word sometimes like madurainum even the even the most uh, common word that is just below the below their tongue and they are not able to utter it out they know internally what they want to speak but they don't able to recollect what exactly the word is exactly what happens with the madurainum also where he is not able to find out the correct word what exactly should be the correct word in this particular conversation although they know internally in their mind that 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 what exactly the feeling of word is but not able to find out the correct word and same thing happens with netumbriaticum also and then they are awkward in talking they feel they their talking is not the rhythmical talking or the the talking that we see the rhythmic way of talking a fluent way of talking that we see in argentum metallicum that we see in lacases that we see in uh, uh, other talkative remedies but you don't find those kind of rhythm those kind of fluency that we see in antimonium crudum antimonium crudum is a very good talker a very good orator argentum metallicum is a very good oratum orator but netum reticum is lacking those qualities they are awkward in talking rather the many time misspells or their talking is not a rhythmical well it's a jerking kind of talking an uneasy way of conversation so these are some of the common traits of netum reticum awkward hasty drops things from the nervous sneak weakness these are some of the characteristic phenomena of netum reticum that we read in all the mathematicals they have a tendency to drop things because of the nervousness because of the internal weakness they feel 
they have a tendency to drop things and of course many metamedicals many remedies have these kind of uh, awkward tendency apis mellifica is one bovista is the one which has a tendency to to being awkward to drop the things but if you study in bovista also this is being made a general symptom awkward tendency to drop the things but you open the herring guiding symptom in bovista you will find this awkward tendency of bovista is only available when the patient is suffering from urticaria not a general statement while in the metamedicas about the bovista they have made it a general statement that bovista is the one individual who is awkward who has a tendency to drop things no if you go big in the herring guiding symptom and open the chapter of bovista you will find awkwardness of bovista is only reflected when he is suffering from urticaria it's not a generalized statement for bovista but they have made it general so haunted with thoughts coming back to nitromyraticum haunted with thoughts that something unpleasant will happen they are quite fearful even if you see the dreams of nitromyraticum they are quite they, they have the dreams of robbers eventually they even sometimes they get up and check all the doors whether doors are closed or they are quite fearful and they have they are being haunted with the future that something bad is going to happen something this is the basic trait of natrium reticulum they might not be having any history of unpleasant event they still they have this tendency that something wrong might happen something bad may happen so haunted with thoughts that something unpleasant will happen this is again a trait of natrium reticulum personality so uh, this is uh, uh, what up to we can talk today because we are coming close to the Uh, end of session but uh, again i will continue with nitromyraticum uh, day after tomorrow uh, at same time uh, around 3 pm 3 to 4 30 again i will be there uh, talking about the remaining part of nitromyraticum and uh, uh, meanwhile if uh, any of you have any queries regarding uh, this deliberation uh, for the 5 minutes uh you are welcome to uh, to talk about this i would be happy to uh, answer your questions is there any any question should i go in the chat section somebody has written that is this true that natomeratic child is the unwanted child his mother wanted to abort him is this no this is not very much true about the natomeraticum they don't have such kind of parenthood where they have been strictly dominated or they have been unwanted in their life it's not if it is an unwanted child and the mother wanted to abort out of any reason then it would be more uh, a threat for uh, magnesium rather than being natromyraticum this is what i say that if you look about the natromyraticum childhood also there are no apparent causes like we have the causes for a carcinogenic child to develop we have causes for lycopodium child to develop we have causes for the hydrophobinum child to develop they have the base we have a causes for mercury child to develop but if you look in the pathology of natromyraticum there are no apparent cause just a simple uh, life or a simple family life the parents are leading their their homely atmosphere is like a simple average life that we see in day to day practice there is nothing like that we see the strict parenthood or they are being dorm uh, dominated or they are being suppressed or they are being put in the rules regulation or the uh, parents are having the Uh, the anal rigidity where they are they are so dominant that they don't want their child to behave in a in a in a uh, any other manner they wish them to appear so that kind of suppressions are not there in natomeraticum yeah if it is an unwanted child where the mother wanted to abort the child it is more likely to be magnesium than natomeraticum one more question from dr rashmi can natramur generate yeah. sad story be sad, sad stories repeatedly to gain sympathy see if we talk this is again a controversial phenomena about like uh, natramur first thing is they will not narrate any story because it is very difficult to open rather they are such individuals who feel feel themselves self sufficient 
they don't need anyone and it's not that they are uh, having no need it's not that it's like their own internal feeling that they are self sufficient they don't need any help they don't need any help and they are happy in their own loneliness they are happy satisfied in their own uh, own world they don't need any help and that's why they are not likely to narrate any sad stories for gaining the sympathies no it it, it is not the trait of netum raticum they will rather not narrate any story if you start doing the case taking with netum raticum and you start poking them then it would take a certain amount of skills a certain amount of tact to to bring out symptoms in them and even then when you start communicating with them their symptomatological reflections would be very brief very concise they are not good talkers also and they are not very good in communication so rather they prefer to speak in monosyllable you you ask a long question but uh, uh, their answers would be relatively short so they are not in habit of making any sad stories for the sake of sympathy no this is not the part of their personality a patient question uh, yeah, i can see the abida salam uh, a patient presenting with all the pictures of atomeraticum how is his thermal state is extremely chilly can atomeraticum be yes it can be because if you talk about i will come uh, in the my later Uh, slides about the thermal reactions of netumbriaticum because they are also controversial many many places say the netumbriaticum is an absolutely warm remedy but at the same time they have a tendency to catch cold the moment they go in the cold they are and they start their uh, coriza coming out nosy even if when they are being enough uh, enough cold enough warm enough warm then again they feel aggravated when they are being enough chilled then again they feel aggravated so thermal reactions plays important role but if the whole is agreeing if the core is agreeing if the entire constitutional totality is agreeing for the netumbriaticum then you can discard the thermal reaction in case of netumbriaticum because netumbriaticum is many times equally susceptible to cold so you cannot put exactly netumbriaticum to be the hottest remedy a typical warm remedy no you cannot put netumbriaticum in that Uh, slot it is somewhere midway between the heat and cold it's not absolutely or always a warm remedy it has a tendency to catch cold as so even if the thermal reactions are not agreeing and constitutional totality is reflecting to netumbriaticum you can definitely go ahead without any reservation so i think time is up Yes, sir. There is one more last question. I think from Doctor Anju. Yeah. Mind symptom of netum thyroid are through clinical verification, yes, and is and is it a good drug for adolescents? Yes, definitely. It is the it is a drug for every group of individual, whether it is a child or adolescent or anything, any 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 age group. and of course uh, children mental symptoms are coming out of the clinical verifications only it's not only because of the i don't say that they don't appear to be well behaved but as i told you there is a one core phenomena in atomeraticum that is the hysterical aspect they may appear well behaved but if you dig them if you poke them and then you will see the real atomeraticum coming out so it's not that the, that there is this well behaviorness or the this disciplined attitude of netumbriaticum is more a covering of netumbriaticum the real netumbriaticum lives inside and that you have to bring out any other question uh, uh, from dr bhavya mohan ha huh. netum you thinks of unpleasant things of future going to happen with them or other it can be both way mostly they are self concerned individuals it's not about the others it is more about themselves that something is unpleasant to take place to happen with themselves something unpleasant is in, is going to take place in the family this area is limited either to the himself or to the family it's not the uh, negative clear ones that uh, that can see the the mishappening events or some accidents taking place in the society or in the country or on the state or in the city it's not like that their aura is very limited it is more limited to himself or to the close members of the family it's not uh, beyond that part so it is a negative uh, feeling that they many time perceives but mostly for their own self not for the others 
thank you so much sir i think every each uh, we had a very good question answer session today and each uh, each each one's doubt is being uh, cleared so uh, i i uh, i want to thank you sir on behalf of the whole team for being thank with you. us today we have another session which will be the continuance of this session a day after tomorrow uh, of Tark tarkeshwar sir only i hope everybody will join us for the same and learn about natramure more so uh, yeah thank you so much sir um, we 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 were glad that you uh, you were here with us today so thank without you. wasting uh, much the much of my time let me just call upon uh, our second speaker dr alok mishra sir who is with us again uh, and uh, i he'll be discussing on the topic disease classification i welcome you sir he's uh, he's, the uh, he's the associate professor uh, at uh, mahesh bhattacharya homeopathic medical college and hospital government of west bengal and honorary physician to his excellency the governor of west bengal so he'll be discussing on disease classification without let's just begin the uh, session sir i hand over the session to you thank uh, over to you sir uh, thank you dr yashika how to uh, start my presentation because uh, <coughs> dr yashika how to start uh, i have to take my slides from uh, I'll, i'll just help you out sir wait yeah i'll just help you out okay i think it's it's, it's available now yes 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 so if i have to, i have to uh, move next for the next slide is it yeah, sure next for the next slide yes sir okay thank you dr yashika and thank you dr tarkeshwar sir it was very nice uh, hearing you after a long time and it's always very nice to hear you sir thank you so welcome everybody and uh, thanks to uh, vijan th thanks to this uh, uh, homeopathy 360 for this uh, very nice concept concept of bringing the homeopathy under one umbrella that is uh, definitely uh, definitely a very mature and very very welcome thought which uh, has been uh, put forward by dr yashika dr uh, and uh, my best friend uh, manish jain and uh, we really thank them from uh, i personally i thank uh, manish ji and yashika from the whole homeopathic fraternity for uh, uh, this beautiful concept of bringing all everybody all teachers under one umbrella so everybody will be able to learn and uh, will be able to exchange their views and thoughts uh, from this note uh, we proceed forward uh, what topic today i have taken is the general survey of the if we uh, uh, if we have to start this topic see first uh, not very much exerting upon this word survey but little bit we have to think if you if you go to the page content page of organon of medicine uh, we'll find this word there uh, where where in dajens translator translation it has been mentioned that from aphorism 72 to 81 it deals with the general survey of the diseases hennemann categorically categorically uh, uh, constrain himself from using the word classification please i'll again repeat hennemann categorically constrain restrain himself from using the word classification we should not enter into much detail of these two words but uh, one thing we have to be very sure prior to the... namaskar sorry sir main phone nahi utha paya aaj koi webinar thi meri बस अभी जस्ट फिनिश हुई है वी आर हैविंग सम नेटवर्क मीडिया कंपनी था अभी आज हो गई आज सर केशव सर हैज नॉट यू टू इट हां जस्ट अ मिनट सर जस्ट अ मिनट आई विल आई विल आपको लिंक भेजूंगा सर उसका डॉक्टर तारकेश्वर सर जी सर आई जस्ट कॉल हिम सर यू कैन हां हां Okay, so uh, if we if we move to the previous editions of Organon of Medicine prior to this uh, fifth one, we will uh, find that Hennemann uh, he uh, uh, he he disowned the word classification. He said that classification of diseases which the books of pathology have done was very uh, what do you call it uh, ambiguous and it was not at all useful. because using a term for certain set of symptoms he was henman was against this view of classifying symptoms 
if we look at the survey what do we mean by survey if we see survey is uh, observing the thing in holism and once we have observed the things then we can say this 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 were ob our observation the survey that we have done this was our observation but when we start classifying something prior to classifying we have to make certain norms that we will divide things into these classification according to these symptoms according to these classifications we have to classify so henneman was against classifying diseases that's why categorically he has used the word survey not entering into the much details of uh, these two theoretical words see my my th my my fashion and my thinking of teaching organon is that i want to explore more of the practical aspect rather going into the history part or rather entering into the uh, dictionary meaning of any word so uh, we we should be more concerned regarding the practical orientation and practical format of the things rather than entering into these uh, uh, dictionary meaning so with this uh, let us start uh, this general survey of diseases that starts on 72 to 81 aphorism but before before starting this one let's have this aphorism 3 into our mind let's have this aphorism 3 what is aphorism 3 aphorism 3 is nothing but the whole organon in a nutshell it is nothing but a gist of whole organon in one single aphorism that is aphorism 3 if this is the arrangement that i have made i have i have tried to try to uh, break this aphorism into points and then by the side i have written which aphorisms correspond to them if we see uh, uh, in aphorism 3 henneman has said that three there are three essential uh, points that uh, physician must note down when he is trying to uh, treat any disease first he says knowledge of diseases knowledge of medicine how to apply the knowledge of medicine to the knowledge of disease these are the three basic points then furthermore he says that four further points are required that is we should be a physician must uh, know the proper time of repetition physician must know the obstacles in the way of recovery physician must know the exact mode of preparation and physician must know what is the proper dose of a medicine and if you if you just put the aphorism numbers there you will get that from aphorism 72 till the last of organon the whole of the organon has been incorporated in aphorism 3 aphorism 72 to 104 this gives the idea of diseases the knowledge of diseases aphorism 105 to 145 henneman gives about the knowledge of medicine through the way of drug proving from aphorism 146 from aphorism 146 to 244 henneman gives about the application of homeopathic medicine in different type of disease condition may it be intermittent may it be mental disease one it may it be one-sided partial local diseases or the internal diseases or whatever different kind of disease condition and how we have to apply homeopathic medicine this is this is up to a for 244 from a for 245 to a for 251 henneman talks about the proper time of reputation from a for 252 to a for 263 henneman talks about the obstacles in the way of recovery this is further can be divided into three parts first he is acting like an obstacle how to deal with it then he says if the physician makes any medicine his favorite or he starts hating any medicine that is also a type of obstacles then for 258 to 263 he says if the diet and regime of the patient is acting like an obstacle so obstacles 252 to 263 is obstacle to the way of recovery which can be further divided into these three categories that is not the uh, discussion of today's topic then from a 264 to 271 Henneman talks about the way of preparation of medicines how the medicine is to be prepared in the genuine and the most reliable manner from a 272 to 287 and further Henneman talks about the proper dose what should be the size and the way a dose has to be administered so starting when we enter into the practical part of organon that is 71 onwards to from 72 till the last everything has been incorporated into aphorism 3 so this was a nutshell aphorism 3 we are just concentrating on the first part of this aphorism 3 that is knowledge of diseases if we see aphorism 3 anyone says that the knowledge of disease 
comma indication knowledge of disease comma indication is required so the knowledge of uh, disease has to be gathered under two headings one is knowledge of disease in general and second is knowledge of disease that is indication which will be required for the purpose of prescription so we should have the general knowledge of diseases that the that the that we learn through the survey of diseases and after we are completed with this general knowledge of diseases we should in each and every particular patient what is their prescribing indication that we will learn through the process of case taking so this knowledge of disease can be divided into two portion one is knowledge of diseases in general and knowledge of disease in each case in particular that we will gain through the purpose of uh, uh, through the way of case taking so our today's topic is just we are concentrated uh, into the general knowledge of diseases the knowledge of disease in general that we will uh, learn through this general survey of diseases what are the types of diseases we intend to treat what are the types of diseases we intend to get in our clinics we are just concentrating on this particular um, this particular area of uh, general survey of diseases uh this this is the broad uh, broad broad uh, concept of general survey of diseases general survey of diseases can be broadly divided into uh, three portions one is indisposition uh, second is acute diseases and chronic diseases uh, acute diseases that is a for them 73 that can be further divided into individual type sporadic or epidemic but chronic disease chronic disease can be divided into three portion that is artificial chronic disease secondly inappropriately named chronic disease and thirdly the true chronic disease we are just concerned with this area of uh, general survey of diseases moving on one by one that is uh, we are talking about a for them uh, 72 to 81 what we have just dealt with uh, so now aphorism 72 aphorism 72 is the aphorism where henneman is talking about what are the characterization what are the characteristics of an acute disease and an chronic disease what are their features and how we will discriminate them this is since uh, uh, beginning we have been learning if we think of a acute disease acute disease there is rapid morbid process of abnormally deranged vital force what does this mean rapid morbid process please we have to we have to concentrate upon this word rapid morbid process yesterday yesterday a person was moving on his bike he was returning from his office to his home his residence while returning back he got wet in rain and after getting wet in rain he developed that is sneezing acute coryza fever bo body ache malaise and everything in a in a span of in a span of half an hour in a span of half an hour at 5:30 he was returning back to his home and in the way back his home he got wet in rain and by getting wet in rain by getting wet in rain he He, he suddenly developed this fever, malaise, body ache, acute coryza, sneezing, everything. This is something that is rapid morbid process that we call as rapid morbid process. On the other hand, if we are uh, uh, on the other hand, if we are discussing about the chronic diseases, if we are discussing about the chronic diseases, it is said that they have very imperceptible beginning. They have very imperceptible beginning. What do you mean by imperceptible beginning? imperceptible beginning meaning thereby that the beginning is not at all palpable we will not be able in a general case we will not be able to palpate the beginning when that chronic disease actually begin that is very difficult to palpate in this chronic disease say i will give you an example i will give you an example uh, uh, there was a girl there was a girl girl was having an affair with a boy at the tender age of say 17 18 19 or say 20 unfortunately uh, his family member his parents forced him to marry somebody else because there was uh, they were not uh, allowing her to uh, have a uh, love marriage and 
um, she was forced to get married to somebody else whom she didn't like. That happened when she was at the tender age of 20. Since then, her disease process will start to begin, maybe, maybe. And by the age, by the age she turned 25 or 26, for the first time when she conceived, for the first time when she uh, conceived, she had an, uh, what you call it, say miscarriage. And after that miscarriage, her menstrual cycle is irregular. She is always having off and on bleeding. Now, now this girl comes to you at the age of say 30. At the age of 30, this girl comes to you for the treatment. But if you start analyzing that, that, that her disease is started at the age of 20 and she is coming at the age of 30. And though the patient, definitely this patient will not be able to recollect that this present menstrual irregularity is because of her disappointment in love that she met 10 years ago that she will not be able to even she cannot think of it the, the girl who doesn't have that idea of anamnesis who doesn't have an idea of the development of a chronic diseases this girl in for the god's sake she will not be able to conceive that her her, her present menstrual irregularity is because of the disappointment of love that she met 10 years ago. So this is what we call as imperceptible beginning. The disease that we are having today and before us, the disease with, that we are intending to treat, intending to cure today has, an, has, a, has, a, has, a, has a beginning which was very imperceptible. Uh, imperceptible that maybe 10 12 20 years 30 years ago that that disease has started to grow even patient cannot recollect to that point that this was the point this was the life event that happened to her she will not so this is the difference between uh, between acute disease and a chronic disease acute disease we said that at 5 30 a man left his office for uh, to return back his home and in the way home in the way home, he got wet in rain. And 5.30 this happened. And by 6 o'clock, he started having fever. He started having malaise. He started having body ache, coriza, sneezing. All within a span of half an hour. This was rapid morbid process. And because of this, because of in, in acute diseases, very clearly in most of the cases, we will be able to get the causation very clearly very much tactful case taking is not at all required for acute diseases but for chronic diseases if that tact that knowledge of human nature we are lacking we will not be able to get this imperceptible beginning to know so this is the difference between acute and chronic acute disease has rapid morbid process whereas on the other hand the chronic disease has a small imperceptible beginning that is, please make this point sure for the purpose of case taking, for the purpose of practical orientation of disease curing. This is very much required. What do you mean by rapid morbid process and what do you mean by imperceptible beginning? Now, the second difference, second difference, if we see that uh, uh, the uh, second point that acute diseases finish their course quickly in moderate time. See, that person who was returning back from office at 5.30, he met, uh, he, he got wet in rain and by 6 o'clock he started developing fever, malaise, body ache, acute coriza, sneezing and all that. By 6 o'clock he was down with the fever. If we prescribe any medicine, maybe by 8 o'clock or by 9 o'clock he'll be, be, he'll be well and back to his work. If we do not prescribe any medicine and this disease happened to be a very... A, a mild one, a moderate one, may be possible by the next morning or the next day. After two days, he'll be fine without any medicine. Or, or if the case is of very severe, of a very severe intensity, may it may lead to, to pneumonia or anything such like things, which may not get well of its own, may terminate in death, may not recover of its own. So. There are two outcomes of an acute disease. There are two outcomes in acute diseases. One is, one is, if it is a mild or a moderate one, 
in a span of a time in a span of time say one day two day three day one month or whatever is the uh, natural history of the disease within that span of time patient will recover of its own whether we prescribe any medicine or we don't prescribe any medicine that doesn't make any difference this is the first course that an acute disease will have secondly if that acute disease is of a very severe intensity if that acute disease is of a very severe intensity in such cases if we don't prescribe any medicine the patient may terminate into death the patient may terminate into death the same thing is happening with covid 19 also the 95 96% of patients are recovering either with medicine or without medicine whereas there are 3 to 4% patient who are uh, uh, falling prey to this disease with or without medicine so acute disease is a one which tend to complete they have the tendency to complete their course either in death or in recovery whereas now let us see this chronic diseases chronic diseases are one such diseases which don't have the tendency to end please please i will make a difference acute diseases have a very sharp opening and a very sharp end both opening and ending of an acute disease is very clear cut very sharp we can always make it out when there is a beginning and when there is an end of an acute disease but for a chronic disease the opening the beginning of the case is very imperceptible very very blurred image we get of the beginning of the chronic disease similarly the ending of a chronic disease is also very blurred it is never very clear so the chronic diseases never 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 recover of their own like we said in acute diseases whether we prescribe or we don't prescribe any medicine patient of a mild or a moderate variety may recover of its own from the diseases this is the difference with the chronic disease in chronic diseases however mild the disease may be however moderate the disease may be patient will not recover of its own without the aid of anti miasmatic medicine please i am again repeating in acute diseases whether we prescribe medicine or we don't prescribe medicine the patient of mild and moderate cases will recover of its own whereas some of the severest patient may terminate into death this is the fate of acute disease whereas chronic diseases whereas chronic diseases chronic diseases the if we don't prescribe any medicine it will go on and on and on to the infinite level it will go on and on to the infinite level so in chronic diseases we we never find an beginning nor we find an end until an in the natural history of chronic disease we do not find the beginning neither we find the end whereas in acute diseases there is a sharp beginning there is a sharp fall this is the second uh, difference between acute and chronic disease thirdly thirdly if we are talking about the chronic disease there is always a chronic miasm behind the chronic disease without a chronic miasm a chronic disease can never exist so this is the difference between acute and chronic diseases now if we are talking about the uh, if we are talking about the uh, for example 73 that is the where hanneman has categorized the acute diseases into three 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 broader category one is the individual acute disease the sporadic one and the epidemic one <laughs> so if we are talking about the individual uh, acute diseases individual acute diseases uh if we are talking about the individual acute diseases anyone says that these occur due to the transient explosion of the latent sura can we have that idea what do we mean by transient explosion of latent sura can we have that idea what do we have that transient explosion of latent sura i'll give just one example i'll get uh, give just one example see uh i was uh, again i was moving uh, on a bike and there was a cold breeze of air and as i got that cold breeze of air that cold settled in my tonsils and i started developing tonsillitis the symptom of tonsillitis i developed the symptom of tonsillitis but at the same time if we see there were 
thousand and thousands of people who met that um, met with that cold breeze of air but they never developed the tonsillitis why was i i was the only person that met with the tonsillitis after meeting with that cold breeze of air why what was it it was just because that my latent sora was there and by the by the attack of cold breeze of air there was transient explosion the latent sora transiently woke up the latent sora transiently woke up in the form of tonsillitis in the form of tonsillitis i developed a symptom there was pain there was redness there was uh, all sort of uh, problem in deglutition in eating in drinking everything i developed like a peak if it happens that i prescribed any medicine it will subside or if we don't prescribe any medicine we just do gargle with hot water it is possible that within 24 to 36 or 48 hours it will subside of its own so behind this individual acute diseases there is always this latent sora that is the transient explosion of the latent sora there is a latent sora which was attacked which was excited which was excited by this some trigger factors or some exciting factors because of some exciting factors this latent sora was excited latent sora was transiently excited which produced in the form of an individual acute disease there are so many examples henman has quoted i am giving just one example uh, which is very 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 easy to understand very easy to comprehend this attack of tonsillitis after getting a cold breeze of air so uh, uh, individual acute disease there may be uh, there there are always some exciting factors exciting causes like excess of food insufficient supply of it uh, uh, attacking a cold breeze or whatever the, these are uh, some of the topics that we have and what was the reason behind it it is because of the transient explosion of the latent sora because of this transient explosion we used to get these um, symptoms of a individual acute one whether we prescribe any medicine or we don't prescribe medicine because this was a transient one this was not a permanent explosion this was just transient explosion of latent sora this sora which has been transiently uh, excited it tends to return back to normalcy whether we prescribe any medicine or we don't prescribe any medicine that this is tend to return back to its normal condition this is individual acute diseases at the background we definitely have latent sora next one is uh, that henry was talking about that is sporadic diseases sporadic diseases uh, this is this we have to uh, uh, make in our mind that these are the diseases these are the diseases that uh, uh, that several people are attacked several persons are attacked here and there sporadic means uh, what you call it scattered sporadic means something which is scattered not congregated it is something which is scattered all over so sporadic diseases is disease which in which several people are attacked several people are affected here and there somebody is here somebody is there in different localities people are attacked and uh, uh, this is something which is called as sporadic now what hanuman says that there may be three causes hanuman says that there may be three causes which leads to the sporadic disease hanuman says the thing which is meteoric meteoric what do you mean by meteoric anything which pertains to this meteor meaning there by this environment anything which is related to the environmental factor which to this meteor the, to this clouds to this any 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 any, any terrestrial bodies like for example this is something which is a historical word meteoric see this is a, uh, this is one very uh, big problem that we are facing is that uh, the words that were used 150 years ago 200 years ago they are almost obsolete nowadays so this is uh, uh, teaching organon for the last uh, 15 years uh, my my conception is that this is the biggest hurdle that a student face while reading organon because the words that has been used in the organon of medicine and the language that has been used in organon of medicine is nowadays obsolete it is not any more it is not in use the english that we understand the english we use and english that we write 
is what is called as a simple english we if if uh, i am uh, i am not very a thorough person in english but if i write a one page of english i am sure i will not use more than two or three comma full stop i'll use comma two or three i am i'm sure i'll not use any exclamation mark i'm sure i'll may not use more than one question mark i may not use colons i may not use semicolons i may not use uh, what do you call bracket the first bracket second bracket and third bracket but the english that was used in the shakespearean time in the hanimanian time was a complex english that was a english that was called as complex english that was imperative sentence that that sentence which is which is started with a negative one that that was the fashion of english that was used by shakespeare by any man and all the stalwarts of that era that not with the standing this diet and regime this was the fashion that was used at that time the english that was used nowadays we do not use these negative sentences so hanuman in if hanuman writes one page of organon of medicine he has used at least say 20 punctuations and because of these punctuations the uh, the modern modern day englishman modern day indian englishman rather i'll say it's a bit difficult for us to understand and follow that organon of medicine so my 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 thing is uh, my thing is if this english is simplified of organon of medicine every student of organon every student of homeopathy will be easily comprehending this uh, what you call it uh, organon of medicine and for this purpose i again thank uh, manish ji and bijan for publishing this organon of medicine by orelli orelli has done one thing that he has transformed the old english into the new form the new english the contemporary english the english that we understand the english that we speak in the english that we write the same english orelli has given in his book of organon of medicine in his translation of sixth edition without tempering any of the meaning of organon he has tried to simplify just the language so uh, from this platform i will uh, recommend this book to every uh, reader of organon the organon of medical art by orelli published by b jan publication house so this is one such book that is very important so uh, coming back to our topic coming back to our topic this meteoric meteoric is something which is related to something which happens in the environment for example very 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 small example i'll take from the first medicine of our materia medica most of the materia medica econite northwesterly winds those who fall sick after attending after meeting with this not northwesterly cold breeze of uh, uh, winds so this is what is this is something which is called meteoric causes this cold breeze of air getting wet in uh, uh, rain this thunderstorm all these all these meteoric phenomena all these atmospheric changes all these environmental changes are nothing but meteoric causes so these sporadic one of the main causes of these sporadic diseases are the meteoric causes secondly hanuman says that there may be some telluric influences also what do you mean by telluric the thing that pertains to the soil to the water all these diseases that we can adore that we can uh, we can adhere to these soil or water phenomena that is all that is telluric causes and thirdly hanuman says and the injurious agent injurious nowadays if we want to simplify these injurious agents we can we can equate this injurious agents to all this infectious agent now we are getting see the 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 first microorganism came into existence many years after hanuman and prior to that existence of, of existence of that microorganism hanuman is talking about that injurious agent the injurious agents of hanuman is nothing but modern day microorganism so uh, if if we are having these uh, three things uh, 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 at the background of sporadic disease that is meteoric telluric and the injurious agents this can lay many people's here and there sick because of these atmospheric changes the water and soil and, and any of these injurious agents falling upon the patient and hanuman says that everybody do not possess the susceptibility to be influenced everybody there are hundred of bikers who are returning home after office everybody didn't fall sick but 
but only that person that one person falls sick because that one person had susceptibility to be affected because that susceptibility to get cold in this uh, tonsils this is called a susceptibility so this is epidemic diseases now uh, uh, moving on to this uh, in epidemic diseases now nowadays very famous word this epidemics of covid 19 so epidemics uh, we say that uh, epidemics are those uh, where many persons with very similar suffering from the same cause same identical cause when this attack a uh, congregated area when this attack a large area a sporadic area was a small pockets pockets of area segregated but in epidemic diseases on the other hand what we have a congregated area concentrated area through a large large surface which is uh, spread about that is what we call it epidemic disease the causes that Henman uh, wrote here he says that the war inundation famine and the peculiar acute miasm what is that peculiar acute miasm we'll just try to uh, find it out in the next slide Henman says that these are the things that are uh, these are the things that are that are there in the at the base of epidemic diseases war inundation and famine Henneman classified Henneman classified the uh, the the epidemic diseases into two basic uh, category. He says that they may be non-recurring and they may be recurring. If they are non-recurring, non-recurring means that they will attack the person only once in their lifetime. And this he said that this is because of the fixed miasm, the my the disease, the acute disease, which are because of the fixed miasm that also has been narrated in aphorism 46 he says that these are only once in the lifetime the patient will be suffered maybe smallpox measles whooping cough scarlet fever mumps these are the diseases that patient suffers only once in lifetime on the other hand uh, on the other hand there are uh, other epidemics like yellow fever plague cholera these are patient may suffer many times in their lifetime these are recurrent acute miasm in the footnote, Henneman has given examples of Econite and Belladonna, where Henneman says that Econite is for Purpura mellitus and Belladonna is for Scarlet Fever. Purpura mellitus is, on the other hand, sporadic type of diseases, whereas the Scarlet Fever is on the other type of epidemic type of diseases. So Henneman, in the footnote, also tried to classify these uh, two things. Now, moving on to the very important and the practical aspect of this uh, today's topic that I will I would like to elaborate more and emphasize more. See, uh, the Henneman is now moving on to the chronic disease. Chronic disease Henneman has classified uh, basically into three bigger, bigger uh, topics. First is the artificial chronic disease. Secondly, he says about the inappropriately named chronic disease. Thirdly, he says those the true chronic diseases now first moving on to the artificial chronic disease that is they act like they behave like a chronic disease but they are not the true chronic disease they behave like chronic disease but actually they are not the true chronic disease they are artificially produced they are artificially produced by whom by the faulty medical art of the physician this is what all at physician made chronic disease physician has prepared the ground for the development of these chronic diseases so artificially because nowadays nowadays it is more prevalent even in the earlier ages and now also the patient is accustomed to many of these heroic and violent medicines daily 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 every day is taking a plentiful of a, a, a bowl full of medicines and because of the effect of these diseases violent and heroic medicines in large and increasing doses an artificial disease is being created in the patient an artificial disease is being created in the patient for which Henneman says there is no cure i'll take one very 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 small example there are thousand and one example which we can quote for artificial chronic disease but very practical approach a patient who is taking uh, antihypertensive uh, drugs any beta blockers if that patient is taking those beta blockers or antihypertensive uh, drugs for continuous long time 
a time will come that when patient will start having swelling in his ankles and until for such swelling in the ankles until and unless patient stops this beta blocker or antihypertensive their drugs any homeopathic medicine or any medicine in this world will not be able to eradicate his swelling near the ankles so this is a very small example of artificial chronic disease there are thousand and one examples of this artificial chronic disease Hennemann says that this is one of the Hennemann says that if we, if we move further about this uh, artificial chronic disease there are two footnotes there are two footnotes in uh, uh, what you call it uh, in uh, organon of medicine there are two footnotes one is a for them 235 235 where anyone says that china has been prescribed where china was not at all indicated in large doses china was prescribed and because of this over prescription of china because of this over prescription of china there is a condition which he has termed as chronic bar dyscrasia in 235 as well as in 276 where china was the medicine but again it was prescribed in very high doses in very enormous quantity they are also a type of chronic disease mimicking a con chronic disease made of the which he called as chronic china melody two places where any man has given examples of this artificial chronic disease one more place a for example 41 if you see the for example 41 where any man is talking about the masked venereal diseases where the mercurial poisoning where the mercurial preparation is being given to the uh, venereal patient and because of this over and the uh, excess doses of mercury over an excess dose of mercury uh, there has been a condition like mast venereal disease has been produced in the patient and uh, this he says that this is a type of artificial disease that is developed for example, 75. For example, 75. For example, 75. Henneman is saying that this artificial chronic disease is one such disease which is most deplorable and most incurable of all the diseases known on this earth. This is one of the most incurable and most deplorable type of disease in this world, which is very difficult to cure. Further, if we read Organon, we will get, for example, 173, where Hennemann is called, calling one-sided partial diseases, and he is saying that they are less amenable to cure, or he is not saying that they are incurable, but he says one-sided partial diseases, they are less amenable to cure. On the other hand, when he is talking about mental and emotional diseases in 230, he says that these are the diseases which are most promptly uh, getting getting uh, getting effect of homeopathy meaning thereby these are the diseases where homeopathy is showing the most triumphant light by their treatment the homeopathy is most successful in these mental and emotional diseases on the contrary of 75 and 173 175 so what is the treatment that anyone is advising for it what is the treatment that anyone is advising Henneman says that these are the diseases which are to be remedied by vital force itself. Henneman saying that no, no medicine is to be prescribed for these artificial chronic disease. No medicine is required for these artificial chronic diseases. The vital force itself has to remediate. Provided, one thing has to be provided, no chronic miasm is lurking in the system. This I will deal in the next, uh, for example, when I am doing 77, what do we mean by this? That this artificial chronic disease has to be treated by the vital force itself, provided no chronic miasm is lurking in the system. What do we mean by this? No chronic miasm is lurking in the system. What do we actually mean by this? This I will deal in the next aphorism where uh, anyone is talking about inappropriately named chronic diseases. So this is uh, 76, that is artificial chronic disease, the disease that is being produced by the in a, uh, that uh, by, by the by the medicinal faulty medical art of the physician, where some violent and heroic medicine has been abused, overused or over prescribed in large and frequent doses that will result into the development of a chronic disease. 
and a, a disease which mimic like a chronic disease, not actual chronic disease. That is this one. Now, 77. 77 is another uh, a chronic disease which is not at all a true one. It is again a, 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 a chronic disease which is mimicking like a chronic disease, but it is not at all a true chronic disease. This is a person 77, which is inappropriately named chronic disease. A disease which is not at all a true chronic disease, but it behaves like a chronic disease. It behave, in behavior, it is like a chronic disease, but it is not at all a true chronic disease. It is also called as pseudo chronic disease. Some, some authors have also called it as pseudo chronic diseases. What are the causes behind it? Uh, uh, there are some avoidable noxious influences. What do you mean by some avoidable noxious influences? Meaning thereby there are some, uh, what do you call it, some accessory circumstances of the patient which he is able to avoid. But because of the maintenance of these avoidable circumstances, because of these maintaining causes, because of these maintaining causes, there, there, there is an, uh, a chronic disease like uh, chronic disease like symptom produced, which mimic like chronic disease, but it is not at all an actual chronic disease. So this inappropriately named chronic disease is because of the uh, uh, continuous exposure to these maintaining causes, continuous exposure to these uh, 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 maintaining causes, some accessory circumstances which are avoidable. A disease uh, is produced, a disease like a chronic disease like behavior is produced that anyone called as inappropriately named chronic disease. For example, if a patient is living in a damp and a cellar, a damp place. So he will, he may produce a symptom like asthma. There may be some symptom like asthma, but that is not the actual asthma. That is not an actual. <laughs> that is not an actual asthma, but he is behaving like as if he is having asthma. So if this patient has to be cured, if this patient has, be, has to be treated, first duty is that his dwelling his place of residence has to be shifted continues to live in such damp and cellar if he continues to live in such damp and cellar his asthma will not get treated or will not get cured so what is the treatment that is required for such an inappropriately named chronic disease Henneman says that improved mode of living Meaning thereby these noxious influences, these influences which act like a maintaining cause, these causes has to be removed. These causes has to be removed. And if these causes are removed, the patient will recover of its own. Anyone says again, provided no chronic myosin is lurking in the system. So now my question is one very practical question now I'm raising. What do we mean by no chronic myosin is lurking in the system? And how to assess whether there is any chronic myosin lurking in the system or not? My question is, Henneman says in artificial chronic diseases, as well as in these pseudo chronic diseases, patient will recover under the improved mode of living, once these maintaining cause or in the case of previous one, this violent and heroic medicines are removed, patient will recover of its own. The vital force will recover the things of its own, provided no chronic myosin is lurking in the system. My question is, what do we mean by no chronic myosin lurking in the system? What do we mean? So, please, I am shifting a little bit to make this point understand. Let us let us take the example of aphorism 94. I'll I'll quote this aphorism 94 here. So, uh, uh, furthermore, if we want to explore this uh, uh, 77 or 76, if we if we little bit uh, move to aphorism 7, aphorism 7 says the role of maintaining cause causa occasional is in the development of disease. Henneman says whenever this causa occasionalis is noted, 
the first duty of the doctor is to remove this causa occasionalis. Whenever this causa occasionalis is removed, whatever remains is the totality of symptom. Now, I will give one example. I will give one example. Uh, a lady comes to you. So, before giving that example, we have to keep in mind aphorism 6 and aphorism 7. Aphorism 6 says whatever symptomatology we gather from the patient, his attendant or his uh, physician's ob own observation is nothing but the portrait of disease. And aphorism 7 says that if we deduct causa occasionalis from this portrait of disease, we will get the totality of the symptom. Is it, is, is it clear? Please. Aphorism 6 says that whatever symptoms, signs we collect from the patient or his attendant, everything amounts to be portrait of disease. But aphorism 7 says if we subtract or if we deduct the symptoms of causa occasionalis from this, some uh, symptoms of causa occasionalis from this portrait of disease, we will be left with nothing but totality of symptoms. I'll give one example. See, if a lady is coming to you with heavy menstrual bleeding, her presentation is, her symptom is, her problem is that every month she is having heavy menstrual bleeding. This is definitely her problem. This is the symptom that she narrated to you. And if she narrated this symptom, definitely this was part of the portrait of the disease. This was this symptom was definitely part of the portrait of the disease. But upon inquiry, upon inquiry, we came across a symptom that this lady is using IUCD for the last six months or one month. And since she is using this IUCD, copper tea, since the time she is using this copper tea or IUCD, this lady is having heavy menstrual bleeding. Now, please answer me. Can this symptom be a part of the totality of symptom? Can this symptom be included in the totality of the symptom? This was definitely a part of the portrait of the disease. But should this symptom be included in the totality of symptoms? I will say no, definitely a big no. Because this was a symptom which was produced because of the, this was the symptom which was produced because of the IUCD which acted like a maintaining cause which acted like a causa occasionalist and any symptom which is because of the causa occasionalist should not be included in the totality and this causa occasionalist should be removed and once this causa occasionalist is removed the patient will automatically recover to the normalcy patient will automatically recover into the normalcy and the symptoms which are because of the causa occasionalis, which are because of the maintaining cause are never the part of the totality of symptoms. This we uh, the, the, this prior idea we are having. So now with this idea, let us read this aphorism 94. With this idea, let us read now three aphorisms we have to see in consonance. Aphorism 7, Aphorism 77, and Aphorism 94. Aphorism 7 says, Aphorism 7 says that whatever symptoms we are having because of the causa occasionalis should be removed. We should remove the symptoms which are because of the causa occasionalis. And once we have removed these symptoms, the patient will recover of its own. The patient will recover of its own. The patient will recover of its own without having any problem. That is aphorism 7 and aphorism 77. Now, coming on to aphorism 94. Coming on to aphorism 94. 94 says, 94 says that 94 is the case taking about the accessory circumstances. Accessory circumstances. Anyone says in uh, uh, when we are uh, doing case taking of an ex uh, a chronic disease, we should note about the accessory circumstances. And while noting the accessory circumstances, two things has to be meant, uh, two things has to be noted. 
whether this maintaining cause is only maintaining the disease or it has actually produced the disease if you read aphorism 94 if you read aphorism 94 i'll just read it out for you i'll just read it out for you aphorism 94 says while inquiring into the state of chronic diseases the particular circumstances of the patient with regard to his ordinary occupation his usual mode of living and diet his domestic situation and so forth must be well considered and scrutinized to a certain please 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 listen to a certain what there is in them that may tend to produce or to maintain diseases that may tend or to uh, tend to maintain or to produce the disease there are two things one the, these maintaining causes or these accessory circumstances they are only maintaining the disease they are only maintaining the disease meaning thereby see there was there was uh, there was a car in the there was car standing in the uh, garden for say for one month and the car was all right but because the car was standing for say one month the battery the battery of the car was down and the shelf was not able to ignite the car engine and that's why the car was not started at this juncture you call three four guys and these three four guys gave a nice push to the car and because of the push you gave a shelf and car started and once the car started the car started flying with a speed of 50 60 70 80 90 and even 100 irrespective how and when this push to the car was given why because there was piston there was dynamo there was self there was gearbox there was gear there was battery everything was ready made there only thing there was that the battery of the car was in a down trodden condition in a down condition it was not able to ignite the engine and that push just gave that ignition and the car started like anything but say this car was sta standing in the garden and uh, uh, somebody came and they made a theft against this car and they took over the engine now the, the, the car was standing but there was no engine inside and if this car was given a nice push how uh, how strong the push is given this car will not start so long that push is given the car will move and once this push is stopped the car will also stop this is what we call as maintaining disease in such cases the maintaining cause that push is a maintaining cause so long that push is maintained the car will move once the push is stopped the car will stop this is what is there in aphorism 7 and aphorism 77 but please plus please but if there was piston dynamo everything was there as the battery was down and in this case a push was given and you ignited the engine and engine started and after this the car started flying with a speed of 60 70 80 90 and whatever it may be what is the difference between these two conditions i will I, I i i try to interpret these two conditions in the first case where in the first case where there was no engine in the car that was like a for example 7 and 77 meaning thereby if we remove the maintaining cause the patient will recover of its own the car will stop moving once the maintaining cause is removed but but if this maintaining cause has given a nice push to a person who has latent sora in it in his background a person who has latent sora in his background if such a person has given a nice push these maintaining cause has given a nice push to this to this car the engine will start meaning thereby the latent sora has ignited the latent sora is now started it has been activated and activated it has produced a true chronic disease that is the meaning of 94 whether these maintaining causes are just acting acting like a maintaining cause or actually they have produced the disease if they have actually reduce the disease even by the removal of these maintaining cause patient will not recover of its own but if these 
disease has yet not produced these maintaining cause is only maintaining the disease the removal of these maintaining cause the patient will require of its own that is the meaning of efforts in 77 and 76 where it is said that no chronic miasma means lurking in the system if that chronic miasm has been activated even if we remove the maintaining cause the patient will not recover so uh, this is uh, this is what we call as the uh, role of exercise circumstances in case taking please note take a note of this ephrasm 94 now moving on to the true chronic diseases now moving on to the true chronic diseases moving on to the true chronic now uh, moving on to the true chronic disease we have already done this we have already done this but uh, let's let's take a uh, uh, again a look the characteristic of true chronic miasm the characteristic of true chronic miasm anyone says that they arise from chronic miasm they go on increasing with the life till the end of the life and until and unless a true anti-miasmatic treatment is given to such patient patient will not recover Henneman says that the most robust constitution the well-regulated diet and regime the most regulated mode of living the most vigorous of the vital force is insufficient to eradicate is insufficient to eradicate this chronic disease until and unless a true anti-miasmatic treatment is given to such patients why Henneman wherever please please uh, read organon wherever Henneman is writing about these uh, uh, chronic diseases or chronic miasm treatment Henneman is repeatedly saying Henneman is repeatedly saying that most robust constitution the best regulated mode of living the mental and corporeal regime the most vigorous vital force is insufficient to eradicate why such thing has to be said let us go into the history of medicine the father why Hanuman has to repeatedly say so if we look into the history the father of medicine that is the hypocrite he used one word that is vis medica tricks naturally that is the natural power of the body to heal the natural power of the body to heal all the conditions if proper diet hygiene mode of living is maintained this inherent inherent curing power of the body is sufficient to cure all the diseases this was the wordings this was the narration of hippocrates hippocrates says that this medical tricks is sufficient enough to eradicate every diseases if the if the proper diet hygiene mode of living the vivacity of the vital force is maintained every disease can be eradicated by this inherent power of the body Henneman said Henneman said Henneman fully agreed to this concept of his medical tricks naturally when he was talking about the indisposition and when he was talking about the acute diseases when he was talking about the artificial chronic diseases when he was talking about the pseudo chronic diseases Henneman fully agreed to this concept of Hippocrates that is this medical tricks naturally Henneman fully agreed to this concept of this medical tricks naturally but but Henneman was compelled Henneman was compelled to denounce Hippocrates' verdict that this medicatrix is not sufficient for all cases. Henneman says that this this medicatrix naturally is sufficient to eradicate all these conditions like indisposition, acute diseases, inappropriate tinium chronic diseases, artificial chronic disease. But this this medicatrix naturally is not at all sufficient to eradicate the true chronic diseases. The true chronic diseases can never be cured, treated, or eradicated by this medical tricks naturally. However, that is why, that is why every time whenever Henneman is talking about the, whenever Henneman is talking about uh, the, uh, this true chronic disease, Henneman is saying, Henneman is saying the most robust constitution, the best regulated mode of living, the mental and corporeal regime, the vigorous vital force, is insufficient for their eradication and human is just trying to recognize the recapitulate the hippocrates concept that hippocrates concept is not at all applicable 
to these true chronic diseases. So this is why uh, Henneman says th these wordings that has been taken from the uh, history of medicine. And uh, now, aphorism 79. Aphorism 79. Aphorism 79 is the aphorism where Henneman is giving about the idea of syphilis and psychosis. Henneman is saying that syphilis was an old disease. Syphilis was known since uh, 1400 and uh, that uh, French war, since the time of French war, the medical science was knowing about these venereal diseases. But uh, syphilis was known, but unfortunately, prior to Henneman, prior to Henneman, venereal the syphilis and psychosis, the gonorrheal disease and the uh, chancrous disease, both were considered as one and the same diseases. Both were considered as if they are coming from the same position and they turned them as venereal disease. That is why the gonorrheal, uh, gonorrheal uh, disease was also treated with the use of mercury. It was Henneman, not only the homeopaths are recognizing, the medical word, the scientific word also recognizes that it was the Henneman who for the first time separated syphilis from psychosis. Prior to Henneman, the medical word recognized syphilis and psychosis as one and the same diseases two manifestation of one and the same diseases. Whereas Henneman was the first who uh, uh, demarcated that he said, no, syphilis is a separate entity from psychosis and both have a different origin, both have a different course and both have a different, uh, what do you call it, fate. And uh, later on, uh, almost 50 years later to Henneman, Nyseria, uh, Nyseria, uh, uh, what you call it, cultured Nyseria Gonori, and he was the first uh, person who differentiated uh, that you no know, syphilis and psychosis have different organism uh, for their development. Even the medical science also recognizes. So, so syphilis, syphilis uh, is a disease which, in its primary manifestation, they have venereal chancres as their primary manifestation, where psychosis have condylomatous warts or gonorrheal uh, secretions. Uh, syphilis during their primary manifestation only during their primary manifestation can be cured by the uh, large doses of mercurius whereas psychosis and even says that they can be in their primary manifestation they can be treated by the alteration of thuja and uh, nitric acid and uh, this was about 79 syphilis and psychosis now the uh, for example 80 that is the sora the, the brainchild of Henneman, the, the child that Henneman liked the most, the Sora, the Sora child. The uh, Henneman said that Sora is the fundamental cause, please, of all other countless forms of disease. All other, Henneman never said that uh, Sora is the fundamental cause of all disease. Henneman said that Sora is the fundamental cause of all other countless diseases, meaning thereby diseases X other than chronic diseases other than that develop from syphilis and psychosis apart from diseases that are developing from syphilis and psychosis others are others are the countless forms of diseases that develop from Sora he says that Sora is the only real and fundamental cause of all other countless forms of diseases uh, when even said that uh, the primary manifestation of Sora is few vesicles, voluptuous, which are uh, which have uh, voluptuous tickling, itching, followed by burning, and upon burning, they give a peculiar odor. If you move on to chronic diseases, Henneman even said, if this itching is avoided, it is followed by a shudder in the whole body. And anyone says these are the primary manifestation and by anyhow, if this primary manifestations are suppressed, it may lead to the development of innumerable number of chronic diseases. Now, uh, the footnote is very important. Footnote is very important. Anyone said that uh, Henneman had spent 12 years in the development of the concept of chronic disease, chronic mild from 1816 to 1828, and he published 
his chronic disease in 1828. Uh, and for the first time, Henneman deciphered his theory of chronic marasm to two of his uh, disciples, that is Staff and Gross. Henneman, uh, in the footnote, Henneman says that uh, prior to the discovery of Sora, all the physicians treated all the chronic disease as if they are idiopathic, that they are new in their origin. But after my theory of chronic miasm, Sora theory, we will be able to know, we will be able to learn that these different manifestations are different faces of the same Sora background. And he said that by the uh, development of these antisoric medicines, this way of treatment is very much facilitated. Now, moving on to the development of this. Uh, uh, chronic disease, how this chronic disease is developed. Actually, this was an animated slide, but uh, unfortunately, the whole slide is coming at, at, at a glance. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if. Uh, this slide is coming at a glance. I don't have a pen here. Doesn't matter. He says that there was a normal individual. There was a movement of infection. Patient was infected by the miasm. Once the once the patient was infected with the miasm, no sign and symptom will develop until the whole body gets saturated. The miasm will enter into the whole body of the patient and until and unless the whole body gets saturated with the miasm, there will be no primary manifestation. Once the whole body gets saturated with the miasm, once the whole body gets saturated, only then and then we will get primary manifestations on the surface of the skin in the form of few in the form of uh, in case of sora it may be few vesicular eruption which voluptuous tickling itching and all that blah blah these primary manifestations appear on the body once these primary manifestations appeared there can be two type of uh, uh, development that can happen once one is if in the primary stage in the primary manifestation is treated and treated by their specific medicine as mentioned in the for them 284 and even says that if we get this primary manifestation if we get these primary manifestations uh can i share my screen for this slide please uh yashika yes sir you can share you can uh, on the screen share button uh, and open the presentation in your laptop. Yeah. Mm. Yashka, is it uh, visible? My slide is visible. Yes, sir, your screen is visible. You can uh, 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 hide that pop up uh, below. That pop up hide yes, sir. Is it uh, visible, Ashka? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Uh, this is like normal individual. This individual, there is movement of infection. He was infected with the miasm. Now the normal individual is infected with the miasm. The now the whole body gets saturated with the miasm until and unless the whole body gets saturated there will be no primary manifestation on the surface of the skin. Uh, uh, once this whole, when this primary manifestation occurs, two things can happen. The first thing, if this primary manifestation is treated with the specific medicine in large doses, as mentioned in Ephorism 282, fifth, uh, sixth edition, this patient will spontaneously cured of this chronic miasm but this rarely happens with us this is not at all a very common thing that happens with us we do not get primary manifestations generally but this is now actually what happens these primary manifestations are suppressed either naturally or artificial once this primary manifestation is suppressed patient enters into the latent stage of miasm and he continues to be in the latent stage of miasm until and unless there is a trigger factor and once this trigger factor affect trigger factor in the form 
say there uh, in the very beginning i started that there was disappointment of love disappointment of love is again a trigger factor there are numerous thousands of trigger factor disappointment of love is one such trigger factor upon this uh, uh, disappointment of love several accessory circumstances will act several accessory circumstances will act say the corporeal constitution his inheritance his behavior his sexual pattern his culture his religion his climate his dwelling his occupation his diet his living everything will act upon him these are the accessory circumstances so these accessory circumstances through these through these combination combination and permutation of these accessory circumstances the latent sora will pass through and as these accessory circumstances are arranged similarly the secondary manifestation will be of the same kind are you getting my point please the primary manifestation once it is suppressed after suppression of the primary manifestation sora enters into the latent stage of miasm and latent stage of miasm upon the latent stage of miasm the trigger factor acts the patient continues to be in, in the latent stage until and unless any latent uh, sorry until and unless any trigger factor acts upon the patient and only trigger factor acts upon the patient is not sufficient at that moment what were the circumstances what was his occupation what was his familial circumstances what was his mental makeup what was his inheritance all these things will play a role in shaping the secondary manifestations what will be the secondary manifestation depends upon the arrangement of accessory circumstances the way in which accessory circumstances are are arranged the way the secondary manifestation will represent so uh, this is the role of accessory circumstances here if we learn now aphorism 81 aphorism 81 aphorism 81 hanuman says the secondary symptoms of sora the secondary symptoms are of the sora are thousands and hanuman says that sora is hydra headed sora is hydra headed it is thousand headed monster why it is thousand headed monster the same primary manifestation the same latent stage of sora but once so many combination and permutations of accessory circumstances are there so many combinations and permutations of the accessory circumstances are there through which this latent stage has to pass the combination and permutations of these accessory circumstances shape the presentations of the secondary manifestation then more number of permutations are there the more number of combinations are there the variety of secondary manifestation develop starting from dropsy up to the malignancy that hanuman has stated so whenever we are going there for the treatment of chronic diseases these accessory circumstances are very 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 important until and unless we know about these accessory circumstances which may be his physical constitution which may be his moral intellectual character this which may be his place where he is dwelling which may be his sexual habit which may be his occupation which may be his familial circumstances which may be his diet regime which may be his social and religious customs which may be his familial inheritance which may be his habits all these act all combination of all or few of these act as the what you call it uh, uh, a dais through which these latent stage has to pass the combination thousands and thousand combinations of these accessory circumstances as many number of combination and permutations permutations we are having of these accessory circumstances same number of secondary symptoms we can have of sora that's why hanuman says that there are this sora is hydra headed hydra headed thousand headed monster because the number of corporeal constitution it has to pass the way in which these excess circumstances are arranged those numerous ways these secondary manifestation can 
represent themselves. This is the footnote of 81 where Hanuman has discarded that any type of classification of diseases, nomenclature of diseases is not at all required where he quotes Sindenham because Sindenham was one person. He said that any epidemic, it is not at all very correct to name or to earmark any epidemic with any name because every patient of that epidemic is a new one. No two persons suffering from the same epidemic are the same person. So uh, Henneman's last quotation is very right in this footnote. He says, if at all we want to classify the diseases, we can at all say that this is a type. Instead of saying that he is a type of dropsy or he is suffering from typhoid fever, we can say it is a type of typhus. It is a type of cholera. It is a type of dropsy. A type of dropsy will air. A type of uh, a type of dropsy. So uh, this was uh, uh, something about uh, what do you call it? General survey of diseases. It was a very uh, verbose topic. I tried to communicate with the best of my skill. I don't know how much uh, 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 you people have comprehended, but let's see if uh, if if we can uh, get it. If we can get it. Okay, Yashara, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, thank, thank you, sir. We, I think we have five to six minutes left with us. We have queries from people. Can we solve them out? Few queries. Uh, we have, uh, sir, which is what is the different with difference between microbes and myism? See, uh, if 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 we answer this question. If uh, if uh, we all know the epidemiological triad, Epidemio um, epidemiological triad we have studied in community medicine, that there is an interrelationship between agent, host, and the environment. So microbes, microbes is one part of this epidemiological triad, that is the agent. And myism is the host. If that susceptibility of that host is not prepared, to receive the microbe, however virulent that microbe may be, however potent that microbe may be, it will not be able to affect the person until and unless that host has that susceptibility to be affected. Myism gives the susceptibility to the host. And once that susceptibility is prepared, only and only then, only and only then, these uh, microbes will be able to affect. My microbes is not at all the true cause of the disease. Myism is the true cause of disease because it, it gives the susceptibility. It prepares the groundwork for the development of microbes. If there is no myism, there will be no microbes. Even if there is microbes, it will not manifest itself if there is no my uh, myism. Yes, Yashika, any, any more? Yes, so uh, there was a question uh, before. Uh, I think I'll just post that question. Can Hanuman's, uh, Hanumanian's time remedies equally applicable in our Indian cli climate also? Dr. Chiranjeev have asked. And he's asking the, uh, to highlight the use of LM potency in chronic diseases. So uh, by use of LM, LM potency will be out of context, but uh, uh, Hanumanian's times remedy. See, see the, the 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 aggravation for motion, aggravation from motion. It was true 200 years back. It is true for 200 years from now. Only understanding has to be changed. The understanding has to be changed. Hanuman says that is if see. The medicine was proved 200 years ago, 250 years ago. The symptomatology will remain the same because Henneman says that these are based on the eternal laws of nature. The, the symptomatology won't change. The only the representation of the symptoms might change. I will take one example. I will take one example. In Hennemanian time and prior to the development of penicillin, prior to the development of penicillin, mercury was one of the most potent medicine that was widely used everywhere in the world and because of this wide use of mercury 
there was uh, this this mercurial poisoning and this mercurial overuse was very prominent and because of which nowadays in 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 Ellen's keynote in all Metro America everywhere we are getting mercurial poisoning mercurial poisoning and so on but in in 2020 uh, it is it is it is better to say that mercury is nowhere used in uh, medicinal uh, purposes except for the preservation of vaccines and so on and for some amalgamation tooth tooth filling and all this so mercury is not at all the potent uh, uh, what it poisoning substances but we have to find out the places where this mercury can be used i will tell you one place if we go to the if you go to the industry if we go to the leather industry the leather tanning and leather uh, what do you call it uh, that uh, fur raising factories of leather i have been one of my chambers is, is in uh, uh, that area fur raising factory that is there so for you for raising the fur of leather mercury is used and all the persons residing in that area you will get that they are one or the other patients of tinea 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 disease is very prevalent in that area so we have to change the interpretation of the medicines we don't have to we, we don't have to change the materia medica only thing that we have to change the interpretation in the nowadays situations how that how that materia medica can be utilized in the present day knowledge present day knowledge how we can use it how we can utilize it only that thing is uh, required otherwise all the symptoms which were there 200 years ago it is still applicable only the representation understanding of the symptoms can be changed a little bit thank you Ishka. What, uh, anything else thank you so much sir i think it's uh, we have only one to two minutes left so i just want to thank everybody and uh, for being a, such a patient audience as well as you sir on behalf of whole team of homeopathy 360 and vijan i would like to thank you to uh, you, take this take such a session so but, wonderfully each and every uh, aspect one, one, thing more, one thing more yashika through this platform i would like to thank bijan publication Moreover, if B, uh, one thing I'll say, a slogan I'll say, if Bijan wouldn't have been there in India, India wouldn't have grown with homeopathy to the extent it has grown now with time, for, 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 as of now. This is uh, oh, I, I, from, the whole fraternity, I, from the whole fraternity, I thanks to uh, Bijan publication. Thank you so much, sir. That's so sweet of you. I I want to thank uh, you as well for uh, such a se such a great session. I just want to inform everybody that I've put the link of the certificate in the chat box. You can download the certificate from that uh, from that link as well as you can mail us any query you have on webinar at the rate homeopathy three sixty dot com. Plus, I would also request you, sir, to please type in your email ID in the chat box. If anybody wants to ask any queries from you, sure, sure, sure. And uh, I would uh, just inform that tomorrow we have a le lecture of Dr. Uh, Linga Raj, sir, and Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Vishal Deshpande, sir, tomorrow. So I hope everybody is with us tomorrow again to have the session. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, uh, audience, for being with us today. Thank you, Ishika. Thank you, everybody. Okay.